then, and then it was eerily quiet. And then my mind was kind of like, you know, the head in the fishbowl. Then it takes me into the bathroom and says, this is how you brush your teeth. Brush, rinse, repeat, brush, rinse, repeat, brush, rinse, repeat. But there were two girls, and it was like, you'll have to give us a ride. You can't fill us, though. He can't refuse us. He'll let us in his car. The thoughts were all alone in this empty void. You know, the head in the fishbowl. This doesn't look right. They got close enough where he said he could see. Right. Hey, welcome up, back, Rob? Luke. Ah, uh, just kidding. Good. How are you? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, did we think Luke was here for a second? I did. I heard a rumor that he was going to come. Maybe, oh. maybe that's not tonight. Well, but I yeah, I don't know, man. I I I don't know. I don't know what's I don't know what's going to happen. You never know. Like I said, you know, he's a he's a free spirit. Everybody recognizes that. Everybody's trying to get Luke back on the show and everything. A little wild card. We need somebody that can say something really, really stupid after we do the last, you know, scream the the podcast name at the end of the show. Yeah, yeah. A little like that little nugget of wit. Yeah, that, that just comes r- just comes right out of out of him. Something something really just nasty and just, you know, <laughs> just quasi disturbing that comes out of his out of his brain. Well, how are you doing, Rob? Oh, I'm good. I'm trying to get back into my normal routine. Did my yearly stint with The Voice last week, running sound for their auditions and yeah, know, here in Nashville, which I love. I absolutely love working. Well, working how does that, that go, man? I mean, like, what's that? What's that like doing that? I've never really uh, asked you about some of the details on that. Yeah, I can't really talk much about their process or anything, but you know, it's they bring people in, obviously, and you know, uh, they sing a few songs in front of. Um, the casting producers and um, the the one thing I really like about working that show is that they 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 really genuinely care about people. Like they can tell if someone's nervous, or they can tell if someone's um, not on their A game, and or if it's a bad song choice for their voice or something. And they'll really kind of guide them and, and try to try to really give them a shot. And I mean, they they really care about trying to find people that are genuinely good singers. And um, there's not a lot of extra like crap that goes along with it they're not yeah. they're not looking for like a crazy dramatic story or this or that like they you know they, they really take it seriously and they really all of them really love music and really care about what they do so they're just a great great crew to work with do you ever get anybody that really like just really sucks yeah that is just terrible yep oh yeah i mean what's there's <laughs> like what's one of the worst ones i guess you really can't talk about it can you no but there's every now and then there's there's someone that's like um, who told you this was a good idea? There must have been like hundreds of people along, you know, on, on your path to getting here. There could have been like, <laughs> maybe you should stay home. <laughs> but, um, Did the judges say that to them? No, no, they'll, they'll, they're just like you know, they're they're always real polite. Like I said, they'll be like, you know, you're just you're not what we're looking for. And they'll even give them pointers like, here's something you can work on, and maybe we'll see you again next year. And learn how to sing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything. Well, I. I I just kind of imagine that it's, but see, I don't even, I don't, I don't watch that show. I, I have no idea. Do they, do they show those auditions in the actual show? Do you know? No, not at this stage. Um, I gotcha. This is still just the casting phase and then they'll go on. Uh, if, if they make it to the next round, then they'll go on to um, the actual contest of the show kind of thing. And that's, that's really all you ever see. Because, you know, I never really watched American Idol, but the parts that I would watch were the ones that, like the really terrible singers in the beginning of the show. Yeah, see, that's, they like that. They they promoted that kind of stuff, which I think is horrible. Well, that's how you. That's how we got William Hung, though, man. Right. Don't but, you remember William Hung? I do. I do. <laughs> and oh. He was awesome. I, I actually have William Hung's album. Are you serious? I downloaded it a long time ago. It's you're, it's it's Adam, really inspiring. No, Adam, you're contributing. Um, you're contributing to that. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where William Hung is now. We we should get him on the show. Yeah, get him to get him to sing for us. 
<laughs> the Where Are They Now episode. Which, by the way, I can never listen to the song Hotel California the same way again after, because I just automatically start <laughs> singing it like William Hung. Which you still owe me a uh, karaoke version of Hotel California. All right, all right. I got you. <laughs> That'll be the first one we'll do after the 200th episode is On a duck, is visit done. highway. <laughs> <laughs> Cool wind, cool wind in, wind in the air. <laughs> the air or my hair? Uh, well, I don't remember what it, he it, he also did. We are the champions, which is just it's just brilliant, dude. We need we should we <laughs> we need to play some more William Hung in this. <laughs> nope. in, fact, in fact, we'll play some William Hung in this episode, man. No, I'm uh, I'm making we, an we, executive we decision. <laughs> I pay my dues time after time. I've done my sentence, but committed no crime. And bad mistakes, I made a few. I've had my chance and kicked in my face, but I've come through. No. No William Hung? No William Hung. Oh, man. See, it's like, I okay, I... I was. I had a conversation with my children. I, I, I decide. Sorry, it's just I don't know where to begin on this rant. I had a conversation with my children. Yes. About how one of them was talking about the the uh, the catch me outside girl, and how she oh, yes. how how funny she thinks it is, and how she wants to watch her music videos because it's funny. I was like, and I said, no, you can never do that. Don't download that. Don't add one more view to that stupid YouTube channel. Because you are causing this to happen, and it'll keep happening. It'll happen again. We're going to get another one in next month. It's kind of because like, people pay attention it, it, to it's, it. It's 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 just the same as you know the, like the Germans contributing to, to Hitler. It's the people that slow down at an accident looking for a dead body. If, I, if mm-hmm. nobody did that, then traffic could flow, and I could get home on time. But no. well, Luke and I have watched some some of Bad Baby's videos, so we're we're contributors too. <laughs> That's right. She's called Bad Baby. I didn't even want to know that. B H A B. I don't want to know it. No, B H A D, B H A B I I or God. something like that. Yeah, yeah. She calls herself Bad Baby, and and her 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 voice is like is really overproduced too, because I'm sure she's just terrible. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm certain of that. But it's it's just incredibly produced, and she has like corn rolls in her hair. Yeah, it's it's an atrocity. But I, I guess I, I may be one of those people that that does slow down for the for the carnage on the road too, as well. So I'm probably I'm probably contributing to that. Saying if we all just turn our heads, man, it'll go away. Well, I guess that's true, but <laughs> not in this world we live in. Well, we, I guess I always say hopefully because you never know what can happen, but. We have Derek Gilbert and Josh Peck coming on tonight. We're going to talk about their book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. Not to be confused with the movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Little change in tenses there. Based but, on Omega Man, right? What's that? Omega Man? No, Omega no, no. Man. No, no, no. That was uh, I Am Legend. As I Am Legend, yeah. yeah. But I discovered some important information really? earlier last week. And I actually posted this on the Conspiracy Normal Facebook page. This is this is earth shattering. My my entire world has has crumbled because of this. Did you know, Rob, that it's fact and we're gonna have to deal with it? That Jimi Hendrix and Morgan Freeman are the same person. Well, yeah, dude, everybody knows that. Have I been <laughs> uh, have I been have I been out of the loop or something? Yes. No, and you sent me the link to that. I about died laughing at work last week though. The just the 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 I mean, I like these things. I like looking at these things too. There's a lot of them, you know, but but the 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 title and the fact that there's like no room for questioning it. Yes. Is what got me. It's like, oh look, people, this is it. This yeah. is happening. Deal with it. All right. Yeah. It it says it's fact. Now deal with it. <laughs> okay so so at the top we have a picture here okay okay on the left there's morgan freeman 
On the right, there's Jimi Hendrix. Yes. And pull it back up. Okay. It says that, and on the top above that, there's a picture of uh, the. It, it it zooms in on their teeth, and supposedly their teeth are exactly the same. And it says, examining the teeth, you can clearly see the incisor tooth has been pushed further back over over time. That is proof. I see it. Uh, it goes on. You can attempt to deny this all you want, but the evidence is clear. <laughs> Morgan Freeman, the actor known as that pseudonym, was also known as the musician Jimi Hendrix. Now, how do we know that Jimi Hendrix isn't the pseudonym for Morgan Freeman? How are they just assuming that Jimi Hendrix, but that is his real name? I was the first to report this and stand by my findings. That's the person. And then we have a picture of Morgan Freeman with his wife, who's white, by the way, on the left. And another picture of Jimi Hendrix reading Mad Magazine <laughs> with a white lady that supposedly, as I don't know who it is in the picture, but it says, do I need to go on? No, not really, because if you have any ability to critically think and apply common sense, you know for a fact with this scientific evidence as well as the supporting proof of his spouse, now what no one I'm saying is fact. That's in, you know, capital letters. If you claim to disagree, even after you are looking at the proof in front of you, it shows you are thinking in a conditioned state and are and are benefiting from this lie somehow. The facts are clear and the evidence is sound. So we have some even more proof. Uh, Hendrix, uh, Hendrix's hands. Uh, we got, for some reason, a picture of Morgan Freeman with a lemur. Um, and then a picture of Morgan Freeman as the, what was he in the electric company? He was, he was easy reader or something like that. Or he was in the, he was in the show electric company. You remember electric company? Yeah. I barely remember I'm it, but I, I, I know what it is. I, I remember it. I, I do. I, mean, I was born in 76. I remember watching an electric company. But Morgan Freeman got his start in an electric company. That was after his career as Jimi Hendrix, obviously. And then we have a picture of uh, Morgan Freeman. So uh, then we have a little bio of Jimi Hendrix and a bio of Morgan Freeman. So... What do you think, Rob? Well, I mean, have you ever heard Morgan Freeman play Little Wing? It's pretty spot on. No, I've never heard this. I'm just kidding. I would like to... <laughs> that, that would be the ultimate test, though. If you put a guitar in his hands, like hand him a Stratocaster and just see what happens. Yeah, just see if just, he like, just... Just like stand there and wait. And, like, it just, you just can't take it anymore and he just starts shredding. See if he just belts it out. And then he throws it on the floor and lights yeah. it on fire. Yeah. Like, yep. So yeah. as final proof, it says, so what does Morgan do today? He owns a bar in Memphis that plays live music. Go figure. Man, I am uh th- yeah. this 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 was this was utterly utterly shocking. I'm not seeing a whole lot of empirical now evidence here. Obviously we're being sarcastic here, guys. I mean, we don't believe that Morgan Freeman and Jimi <laughs> Hendrix are the same person. But it's interesting. I, I it was it, I laughed my ass off at of this too. I just thought this, this, this is, this is, this is beautiful. This is like one of the most sublime conspiracy things that I've ever seen. It's just, it's just hilarious. It, it, I still the best in my mind, this may be runner up, but still the best in my mind is that Obama is the son of Hitler's daughter and Malcolm X. Oh, that one was pretty good. That one is, that one is golden. But this might get the silver, or the or the bronze in, in my uh, in my estimation. So, here's something from Quora.com. Is there any credibility to the theory that Jimi Hendrix is still alive and well and living as Morgan Freeman? <laughs> the word theory in the 21st century is misused daily. People made up crazy ideas, called them theories, and the internet propels them instead of shooting them down on the spot in favor. Hendrix disappeared in 1970. Like I say, I thought he died, but Freeman started serious acting in the 70s. Oh, all right. 
They are both black. <laughs> Man, I mean. Proof. Proof. Rob and I are both white. We might be the same person. <laughs> you know, I mean, this could be just a, one guy doing both these voices. Those of you get, that are out there, I mean, you've never actually physically met us. You don't know. See, we call that possible. You don't know. Possible, not plausible. You know, and, and Rob could be, you know, I, Rob, Adam, whoever he is, could be working. You know, could you? So we, it sounds like we talk over each other, but in actuality, because it's all post production, all multi tracked anyway. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, we could, we, we could be the same person. Uh, Luke, yeah, well, Luke. You know, that could be uh, one guy doing all three voices. Oh, dude. You know, see, I mean, and, and we're all white, right? <laughs> so uh, that, so they are both black, left handed, and have some similarities. Against different height, age, nationality. I don't really get the nationality part. They're both American, but okay. Maybe he's thinking that Hendrix was British because he got to start in Britain. I don't know. Yeah, could be. Okay, they can all be faked. When Hendrix died, Freeman had already done a few films. Not many, but some to be seen. Could he be Hendrix in disguise? Would he have time to pretend to be an unknown actor while in the peak of his musical fame? Freeman is a bit older than Hendrix, so could Freeman pretend to be a younger musician and when famous, give it all up to become an unknown actor and rise to stardom again? Our famous Hendrix wanted to disappear, stole the identity of an older person, and to be away from the press started to act and become an Oscar-winning actor and the most recognizable voice of his generation. Man. I'm telling you. Possible. I am... I am... uh, you never know i mean okay here's the thing i have no evidence to the contrary does not mean this is true but my favorite is still alex jones is bill hicks (laughs) yeah alex jones is bill hicks one of these days he's gonna come on and be like gotcha (laughs) i got you all which by the way it's funny that you mentioned that because when i posted this um, I think it was on the Radio Mysterioso. I put it on both Radio Mysterioso and Where Do the Road Go groups. <laughs> and <laughs> Smiles Lewis commented that said that this is just like the Alex Jones is Bill Hicks. <laughs> he said he said that him and his friends started that rumor. Really? Yes. See, I thought I came up with that on my own because when I saw them, like. <laughs> I just that's just where I, no I, I had it. heard that before I I because I'd heard Alex Jones talking about it and he's like I'm not Bill Hicks okay <laughs> it's not me yeah that's what he would say you know Morgan Freeman has never denied that he's Jimi Hendrix <laughs> but I did some digging I did do some digging and and I do have a clip oh so this is Morgan Freeman so everybody have a listen. Morgan Freeman at some gathering, possibly admitting that he's Jimi Hendrix. Anecdote about, because uh, I did Shakespeare and, and I, was, I was wonderful, uh, but that one play, I had a costume that looked like a harem type thing, you know, with sash and blousy, and, and I had a huge fro, and they put a band around my head and uh, and I walk out on stage first preview audience I guess it was preview the free theater doesn't have preview do they yeah do they oh, yeah. first preview then was the first time they had an audience and I walk out on stage and somebody way in the back said sing purple haze oh, <laughs> 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 it's not a good start to a fellow is it no, not <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's Morgan Freeman possibly admitting <laughs> that he's Jimi Hendrix. Maybe that's a way to to admit. I think it was a cry for help. It could be. Guys, I'm I'm Jimi Hendrix. I have been wanting to come out for a long long time. It's like, "Oh, you you you, you got me." <laughs> Man, the internet is a wonderful and weird place, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <laughs> I love it though. <laughs> truly, dude. Truly. <laughs> oh man. 
Well, I think with that, guys, we'll go on to the guest. Uh, I might have some more things about actors and uh, celebrities that fake their own death later on. Uh, we know Tupac did for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, pretty certain that Andy Kaufman did. I- I'm still honestly waiting for uh, Trump to take off his mask and reveal that he's Andy Kaufman. <laughs> that's that's what that, I think that's what everybody is hoping. I mean, because you think about it, you know, Trump... He started. In, I mean, everybody started come thinking about him, and uh, he was getting in the in the limelight in around like the mid '80s. Well, Andy Kaufman died about 1984, and everybody's always thought people have always thought that Andy Kaufman faked his own death. So you never know. This could just be one of those long con jokes to see if he could get elected president of the United States as Donald Trump. That's my conspiracy theory, I love and that. I'm sticking to it, man. I, I I honestly hope that that is true. <laughs> Cause so so Morgan Freeman is Jimi Hendrix, uh, Alex Jones is Bill Hicks, and Donald Trump is Andy Kaufman. There you go, folks. All right, all right, guys. We will be back with the guests, uh, Derek Gilbert and Josh Peck. We'll be back in a little bit on conspiracy. <laughs> Hey guys, back on Conspiracy Normal. Rob is here. I am. Say hello to everyone. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and we have on the line uh, two people that I've wanted to get on for a, for a long time. Uh, that is Derek Gilbert and Josh Peck. Hey, how are you doing? Good, and, to, good to be on the show. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, we, we actually got to hang out with you guys over in uh, Roswell last year. Yeah. Which uh, you guys were yeah. there at the Guy Malone's conference, kind of covering it, um, and then uh, Derek, you disappeared at some point, and uh, Josh and Natalina and Rob and I and a couple other people, we ended and Guy, we all ended up at the Applebee's. Oh, that was a super yeah. rainy night, right? Yeah, yeah. It, that was the only night that it actually rained in New Mexico while we were there. Yeah, <laughs> was the night of the yeah. parade. Oddly enough, well, it kept the flies <laughs> away at least. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Oh, only some of them. We brought some of those <laughs> yeah. flies home with us all the way to Tennessee. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah, that was like the that was like the <laughs> land of the land of the land of Beelzebub out there, man. <laughs> it was. It was. Oh, cr- t- tell me about it. We, we did. We did a number of interviews over there at the uh, uh, at, at the Baymont, and uh, I, I swear one of the interviews, and I forget who it was, Josh. Maybe you remember where we started. There was like maybe four flies in the room, but the room was closed. The windows were closed. Joe doors Jordan. were closed. It was Joe, okay. Joe Jordan. By the time we were done, forty five minutes in, literally. There were like three dozen flies in the room. Is they were multiplying. It was like a, being in a, in the middle of a Stephen King novel. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and editing for that for that interview was awful because there were so many flies. So every every time that a fly landed on his face, you, you know, I mean, and, and Joe's like a class act. He'll just run through the interview and just do it anyway. But uh, trying to edit around that, oh man, it, it was it, it was pretty tough without without getting out, you know, without cutting out any of the good content he was providing. Right. Uh, Which, by the way, not to pitch anything too early, but we do have that interview in a very special offer at (laughs) officialdisclosure.com. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I asked somebody what was the deal with the flies and somebody somebody said it's the stockyards. So it's like, look, look, look. We, we live just across the fence. Like we live on a ridge here in the Ozarks. Uh, uh, we're outside of town. Te- we're so far out that uh, cable doesn't reach to us. We can't get cable television where we live. And we live just across the fence, about 150 feet behind our deck is a cattle operation. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, cattle don't produce that many flies naturally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was yeah. crazy, man. It wasn't the cattle. Because you were in town, first of all. Secondly, like I said, we live across the fence from a cattle operation. And there just aren't that many flies. That's true. No, what was funny is when we got there, we drove straight and we ended up at a loading dock. Like we drove straight straight to the load in for the uh, the conference. Yeah. And so the loading area has all these dumpsters, right? 
Right. So, so I was like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of flies because there's a lot of dumpsters, obviously, you know, no big deal. But then I learned when we got away from that area that it was not that – that was not the case. The whole rest of Roswell <laughs> was right. exactly <laughs> right. the same. Right. Yeah, yeah, it was bizarre. And at the Ro- yeah. Roswell, Roswell Mall especially. Oh. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Well, guys, you have a book out. You have co-written it called The Day the Earth Stands Still. And like as I said before, not to be confused with the film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. So I want to get into this. Uh, the, the subtitle is Unmasking the Old Gods Behind E.T.'s UFOs in the Official Disclosure Movement. So some very interesting stuff in here. And of course, we, you know, we, we won't cover it all. But I heard a very interesting thing that uh, Josh said on another podcast that I listened to. And I thought that we would kind of start with this. You know, the whole, a lot of people in the kind of the Christian circles will say that, you know, well, it's, it's demons. It's just demons that, that, that we're dealing with when we're dealing with UFOs or flying saucers or alien abduction phenomena, whatever. But Josh, you said something that kind of perked my interest where you said that, you know, you were kind of tired of looking at it that simplistically. Yes. I'd kind of like to get both of you guys' thoughts on that because I thought that was a very interesting statement. Yeah, and, you know, it's absolutely true because that that's only the first step. And it goes so much deeper than that. I mean, it's really it's not just all demons. I, I don't think what's going on in the alien abduction and, and the UFO phenomenon, I don't think demons are even capable of that level of thing. You know, they can probably contribute to a certain extent, and you know, I have no doubt about that, but it is, you're absolutely right. It's way too simplistic to just say, well, it's all demons. When I was, you know, for your audience, just a really quick, and I'll make this brief, just a really quick backstory on me sure. uh, for those who might not be familiar with me and shame on you if you're not, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> but <laughs> um, I, I, I grew up in a really, really traditional uh, like Southern, I, I, I lived in Michigan, but it was kind of set up like a Southern Baptist, uh, church, you know, household kind of thing. Um, and that was my environment and everything. And it, I mean, it was great. You know, it, it, uh, that environment taught me about Jesus, got me saved, you, you know, all, all the foundational stuff that you want in Christianity. I was provided with that. So, uh, I'm not bashing on the Baptists. Uh, actually most of my friends are Baptists, so I would be in trouble if I, if I was doing that, but, and I'm not, I I'm, I'm totally not. Uh, but when it got to the point and I, I was, I guess I was pretty young. I mean, I thought for me, it was, it was normal that when you're, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, you start, wanting to know about stuff. And I mean, there are adults that are in their fifties, sixties, seventies that, that, well, I just see even some of my own family members, I love them to death, but they don't have questions about this kind of stuff. And if you were to ask them, they wouldn't know how to answer. So I, I had questions about aliens. I wanted to know, uh, are, are, are they real? What are they, you know, is, is it possible for aliens to exist, uh, based on the Bible? And if not, you know, what does the Bible say about it? And I was given the answer, Josh, it's all demons. And I said, okay, well, what is it? What does that mean? You know, where, where are we getting that from? What verse, what verse can you point me to? And then I was told, well, Josh, you just got to take it on faith, but that's not faith in God at that point. At that point, that's, you got to take it in faith that it's demons. Cause I say it's demons and I don't have any other answer for you. Gotcha. You know, that, that was, yeah, that was the pastor or, you know, whoever, uh, being afraid to just say, I don't know. One of the, one of the greatest strengths that I've learned throughout my life is how to say, I don't know and be okay with it. (laughs) it, It's, it's the most honest thing. I mean, most times that's going to be the answer, unless somebody's asking you something that's specific to your, uh, area of interest or speciality or whatever. Uh, but most people don't do it. And when you actually do say, I don't know, but that's interesting, you know, to somebody who has a genuine question that keeps the door open. But when you say something like, well, you just got to take it on faith that I know what I'm talking about and I don't have to explain myself to you, you know, essentially that's what it was that right. shuts the door. And it did for me, I was 12 years old and I stopped going to church. Uh, it wasn't only because of the alien question, but it that was a big part of it. It was a lot of other stuff that I had no idea about because I wasn't given any answers. And, 
uh, so that, that kind of set me on this whole path. Um, but yeah, it, it, it does go way deeper than just demons, than even just Nephilim, you know, Genesis six giants and modern day Nephilim. And, and that type of research is extremely important. And I'm glad that there are people out there doing it, but that's only one, that's only one piece of it really. Uh, there, there's, there's a whole larger framework to this whole entire thing. Uh, I, I really believe, uh, Derek actually laid out the foundation to this in the great inception. I'll pass it over to him so he can explain that the difference between, you know, like demons and fallen angels and old gods and Elohim and, you know, all, all this, all this stuff that were never taught in church. In church, I thought there were angels, demons, God, and the devil, and that's it. <laughs> and that is so not true. And actually, the truth is far more exciting than that, but also uh, on, on the darker end of things, more nefarious and things that the Christian church uh, really needs to know about, which is a big part of why we wrote this book. Uh, so in saying that, I'll pass it to Derek. Sure. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the, the spiritual realm is a lot more... Uh, let's say it's more heavily populated than we've been taught in church. Uh, like Josh said, you know, if you're lucky you attend a church where they actually take the, 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 the Satan and, and uh, demons as, as real, uh, most don't, according to the research by the Barna Group. And uh, we cite some research at the beginning of the book that really sets up why we wrote the whole book, uh, which is, in a nutshell, the modern UFO phenomenon and the modern UFO community is essentially uh, morphing into a 21st century sci-fi religion, and it has mm -hmm. been for a while. It is essentially rehashed theosophy, um, and th that's kind of where we we go from there. Um, the uh, so it, it is a lot deeper than just demons, as Mike Heiser wrote in in his uh, two novels that deal with the uh, uh, the UFO phenomenon. Uh, and, and when you've got a ufologist who can write an exciting story about the UFO phenomenon with the uh, theological chops of a, a biblical scholar like, like Mike. Uh, it's, it's well worth your time to read. He has a confrontation between um, one of the good guys and the, uh, the protagonist, the antagonist, the, the villain in the, in the books, who basically describes demons as puppies. I was like, look, I snap my finger and they come, okay? And I think we're dealing with that level of entity, okay, a watcher level entity, a fallen angel type entity when you get into some of these uh, uh, phenomena that can't be explained through natural means. Demons are for, and we don't know for sure, but this is the working theory. It's certainly what the uh, Jews of Jesus' day believed, uh, the spirits of the Nephilim who were killed in Noah's flood. God sent the flood, wiped evil off the earth. They were part of the evil but their spirits were condemned because they were, uh, and, and the Book of Enoch actually uses the word miscegenated, believe it or not, um, hybrid, half-breed, uh, angel-human. And so they were condemned to wander the earth until the judgment, basically causing trouble for humanity. But they need, uh, they're, they're non-corporeal, their spirit. They need to inhabit a body in order to cause trouble for that person or the people around them. Fallen angels are corporeal. We see angels that interact with humans in a physical way in the Bible. The three angels who visit Abraham and eat a meal with him. The two that uh, then go on to uh, Sodom and get physical with the, um, the, uh, the, the people of the town that want to do harm to Lot and his daughters and so forth. Right. Uh, so, so they are corporeal. Um, one of the things that we want to make clear is that we believe that something is going on, that the UFO phenomenon is real, and that the abduction phenomenon is real. It's just not what the UFO community tends to think it is. Right, right. So many of the sightings, uh, and I'm sure you've, you know, you've, you've talked about this topic. You're probably more expert on this than, than I am for sure. Uh, you know that uh, most sightings are just misidentified natural phenomena. The planet Venus is often misidentified. Um, commercial aircraft, private aircraft, secret government aircraft account for many of the other sightings. Um, I don't know, swamp gas, if you want to throw that out there. But there are some that can't be explained that way, some um, craft that people see that uh, seem to defy the laws of physics. Uh, those, we believe, are manifestations of uh, entities that are visiting the planet. Yes, we do believe Earth is being visited by non-human entities and has been visited for thousands of years. But we believe, and I think historically you can see this in the accounts of um, – uh, if you want to call them ancient astronauts, fine. But in accounts of um, unidentified flying objects over the centuries, they always seem to manifest in a way that 
people can understand in that day. Uh, like the big uh, UFO flap in Texas in the 1890s, they manifested as airships. Uh, was it Alexander the Great in the fourth century BC saw flying shields? Now today right. we see uh, tri- you know, flying triangles or saucers or whatever. And interestingly enough, the uh, depictions or descriptions of flying saucers didn't start becoming popular until after the uh, newspaper accounts of Kenneth Arnold's sighting, the Mount uh, Rainier sightings in 19, June of 1947. And he described them not as looking like flying saucers, but uh, they flew at, like saucers that were being skipped across the water. Yeah, fly, yeah, skipping it, like saucers, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So a headline writer picked it up and changed it to flying saucers, and right. suddenly people were seeing. But the drawings right. that Kenneth Arnold produced actually looked like those, uh, like that flying wing from the uh, Indiana Jones movie, you know? Yeah, a lot of people don't so, know that. They just think right. that they just think well, he saw flying saucers, but yeah, it looks something like the like the flying wing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But then comes yeah, nineteen fifty one. So the cult. The cult. The culture. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, okay, I was, I was just, just gonna, gonna uh, let, let me let me just wrap this with, with this real quick. <laughs> comes nineteen fifty one, and the book. Josh is chomping at the bit. I have yeah. such a small comment, and I, I don't want to derail the whole thing for it. I was just going to say, it follows the culture because they he said flying saucer, the culture grabbed onto that, and then all of a sudden everyone's seeing flying saucers, even though he drew a wing, nobody sees wings. Okay, Derek, continue forever, because that, that was <laughs> That's all no, I want no, to no, say. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, comes 1951, and the movie on which the title of our book is based, The Day the Earth Stood Still, with Michael Rennie as the uh, alien Klaatu and his uh, robot sidekick Gort, uh, that sort of uh, firmed up the image of flying saucers in the minds of uh, at least people in the United States and probably around the world. I mean, it was a huge movie. And they remade it with Keanu Reeves, didn't do it as well as they did back in 1951. But right. that kind of cemented the image of the flying saucer in people's minds. And after that, that's what that's what people saw. Yeah, I, so, I believe that there's kind of a – it's kind of a circle. It's, it's, it's kind of like these things come into popular culture, and then all of a sudden people start seeing these things, and it dies down. And something else comes into popular culture, and they start seeing these things. It's just, it's just like this circle that just keeps mm-hmm. happening. Well, and, and there's a little bit of the whole – Life imitates art, art imitates life thing, too, because right. <clears throat> both the Nazis and the United States military both did develop UFO saucer-looking craft, but mm-hmm. I think it was all experimental and none of it got off the ground, and it just right. kind of further kind of pushed along the whole mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, there's still people today who are just totally fascinated by the concept of the Nazi bell and whether or not it actually flew and whether it was a craft or a time machine or something. So, right. yeah, there's... Been a lot of research into that, and of course, the Nazi. A lot of the Nazi scientists who um, survived the war made it into the United States in uh, you know, under Operation Paperclip. And I know that you've talked to uh, Nick Redford about his book uh, about Roswell, uh, and uh, there are others who, who, like Nick, believe that uh, Roswell was a uh, was a cover up, not of an alien craft. That the alien craft story was the cover up to hide from the American public. Some story, one of which might be that uh, whatever crashed was the product of Nazi scientists who were now on the American taxpayers' di- you know, b- payroll, uh, which wouldn't have gone over very well in 1947. So, uh, and that's something else we cover in the book: the the uh, the long history of the um, uh, the intelligence community's uh, involvement in shaping the narrative, shaping the public's perception of. Uh, flying saucers of unidentified flying objects for their own purposes. Right, exactly. Uh, and yeah, we, Paul Benowitz yeah. and all that right. stuff. And yeah. Well, you know, and, and I, I'm looking forward to talking to Jack Brewer. I only shared, you know, a talk with him for a couple of minutes at the, at the conference there, but I listened to your interview with him yep. and I've read his book and that was really influential in shaping my approach to the chapters that I wrote for the book here. Um, it startled me to realize how far from scientific rigor, academic rigor, some of the best known names in um, uh, research working with abductees have been over uh, over the last uh, you know 40 years or so. Um, and I won't name names because I don't want to cast aspersions on anyone's character. I would just recommend people get Jack Brewer's book, The Grays Have Been Framed, because it is an huh. excellent work. Agreed. Um, so... Uh, I, I just think that there is a lot more to the story than most people are are being told. And as Christians, I think we need to educate ourselves so that we address this topic. Again, the statistics at the front of the book, 36% of American adults, 
according to a 2012 survey conducted by National Geographic Channel, believe that we're being visited by extraterrestrials, that we're being visited by extraterrestrial intelligences, beings from outside our solar system. More than one in three Americans believe we're being visited by ET. That's not a fringe belief. No, no, Especially it's not. when you compare that to the Barna Group's research that shows that only 10% of American adults have a biblical worldview. And that, so, you know, it's essentially, when it comes right down to it, there are more people who believe in ET than believe in God as, he's defined, as he defined himself in the Bible. I want to make a point as well that, in my opinion, from looking at this stuff as long as I have, I think the you. Unidentified flying objects, UFOs, and the alien abduction phenomenon are two separate things. Yes. But I think they have been thrown together, and they're really not together. This whole idea that it that it that it's alien, so you know that this must be A must follow B. Well, it doesn't necessarily do that, in my opinion. Yeah, think about it this way. If you take out the narrative, if you take out all the alien narrative. Um, you, you know, we're so indoctrinated in our culture with that, that it's hard to think in, in, in those terms, <clears throat> but let's say like you take out that narrative, if you know nothing about it and one night you see a weird light in the sky or, you know, let, let, let's even put it in more natural terms. You, you, you see like a helicopter and you know, it's a helicopter, but it's not, uh, it doesn't normally fly over your house. You know, you just see it one day next day. People are breaking into your house and threatening you physically. Would you think to connect those two? Most wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I probably wouldn't even remember that I saw the helicopter, you know, the day before. So when you think about it, it it's it's sort of, uh, you know, a, a, you know, more of like a supernatural version of the same thing. You 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 get people that will see a weird light in the sky, or they'll see some kind of strange craft, even crafts that are changing shapes in the sky. But then you also have this thing that people uh, have have reported being either abducted or being attacked in their house. And, and of course, so, some of that bridges the gap because some will say, well, I was taken on this craft and, you know, I saw the disc. But if you look at those two phenomena uh, separately, especially in the past, I don't think you had the direct one-to-one -one correlation until people, and again, this is how it follows the culture, until people really started making it that and then all of a sudden, so did these beings or who, whoever is uh, perpetrating this. But in both in both scenarios, the alien abduction thing and the UFO phenomena, uh, I think both of them you, you just can't reduce it to one cause. There's a lot of different reason. Uh, Derek, was it uh, was it John Mack who found something like a dozen points of correlation between the alien abduction phenomena and satanic ritual abuse? Yeah, it was John Mack, but it was like three dozen points of correlation. Right. Yeah, the right. Uh, late Har Harvard psychiatrist who uh, he, he, he basically uh, looked back at um, accounts of people who who been victims of, of abuse, ritual abuse, and compared those. And, and you know, there, there's some very uh, generalized things in, involving uh, you know both sets of experiences involve uh, almost ritualized uh, ordeals and uh, you know various sorts of things. But again, came up with about three dozen points of correlation, which suggests more than just a coincidence. But when you go back in history and you, and you look at, um, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, uh, nighttime visitations, well, people, you know, in the Middle Ages knew they were visit, being visited by uh, incubi or succubi right. instead mm -hmm. of extraterrestrials. Again, it's the whole uh, idea that if you're dealing with entities that are entering our space time from another dimension, from, from uh, a, a multiple dimension or a contiguous universe, which is the phrase that uh, kept showing up in the WikiLeaks email releases, um, <laughs> Then, you know, as Christians, you're, you're kind of talking our language here. And we as Christians ought to say, well, okay, you know, since the UFO community is beginning to embrace that as we begin to learn just how difficult it would be scientifically and technologically to cross the distances between stars, uh, they're starting to embrace the extra dimensional hypothesis, which secular researchers have done, like John Mack, like uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, J. Allen Hynek for another. Um, then we as Christians say, well, you know, like Paul on Mars Hill, I see that you Athenians are religious and you've got all of these, um, you know, idols here. Let me tell you about this one over here, the unknown God. Hey, you know, we see that you are beginning to embrace this hypothesis of non-human entities visiting from other dimensions. 
Let's tell you about those because we've got some evidence to suggest a hypothesis that fits these experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where the work of guys like Joe Jordan uh, and Daryl Sims comes in. Right. I've noticed that Joe, oh, get, having the time now, I've actually met him, meeting him and talking to him. You know, some of his earlier interviews, there, there was this idea, I think, that he had that, that, that this was kind of a demonic thing. And now I asked him about that, and now he says – I can't remember whether it was on the podcast or whether I just asked him personally. And now he says, he says, well, I really don't honestly know exactly what it is that we're dealing with. I just know that it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that there's a little bit of – that. I don't – I think that he's – I don't think he's, I think he's modified his viewpoint a little bit, a little bit on that. Like you guys, you know, right. talk about how it's, you know, it's not necessarily demons that we're dealing with. Uh, well, or sure. this and, concept and, of demons. Yeah. And, and, you know, the most important thing is uh, while none of us really know exactly, because we're all human and we're all kind of confined to, you know, three dimensions of space and one in time, and we can't even imagine what a fourth dimension of space would even look like. You know, we, we don't have the capability of that. Uh, while, while we all recognize that it's, it, it's really mysterious and maybe we don't know exactly what we're dealing with, people like Joe Jordan know the answer to how to get it to stop, how to deal with it. We might not know what we're dealing with, but we know how to deal with it. And I, I think that's like infinitely more important. Uh, and that's the cool thing about Joe is, uh, and, and that's why like I've gotten criticized before, uh, because I will interview anybody who has any kind of plausible viewpoint on what this alien thing is all about, uh, especially if it ties in with scripture, I want to hear about it. You know, I, I think that's the only way that we can get to truth is hearing out a lot of different viewpoints and then weighing them all and uh, holding them all up to scrutiny, holding them all against each other and see what you're left with. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've interviewed Joe Jordan and I've interviewed, uh, you know, other people who have different views and, you know, things like that. And sometimes I get some criticism for that, but it's like, you know, guys, I'm not, I'm not sold on any one explanation, but in all of those explanations, there is one thing they have in common, how to get it to stop. Ancient aliens can't tell you how to make this stop. Actually, a lot of times they try to tell you it's a good thing, even when they're abusive, <laughs> when these be yeah, when these beings are yeah. are, are like be, being a, a, abusive and, and uh, uh, hurting people, that's not a good thing. Uh, the only the, the the main thing that pretty much everybody who has a handle on this can agree on is how to actually get it to stop. And I have never heard another alternative on how to get it to stop. There's only one, and it's the the name and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you you, you get you know. Is that are you kind saying of funny? the tinfoil hats don't work? Is that what you're trying to tell me? No, they don't work. And you can have crystals in your pockets and you can uh, <laughs> you, you can get a Ouija board. You can do all that. And it's not going to work. If anything, it's going to make it worse. Yeah, that would, just know, was, that would just attract them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The, but the whatever, circle of salt on the floor, that's that's right out, too. Just for, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah what, whatever, whatever it is, however, uh, however far on the side of demons or, or wh wh whatever it is. Whatever it is, it's subject to that authority, the authority of Jesus Christ. So that tells you something right there. For one thing, that tells you that it, it's it's just how how could it possibly be extraterrestrial? Um, if like like for example, if uh, if somebody wants to to rob me and they want to break into my house, you know, of course, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to get their face blown off. But <laughs> I'm I'm I, I, you know we're. we're we're very much into the Second Amendment here in Missouri, but <laughs> but let's say they managed to get past that. Um, I I could try to say, you know, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. But that that person still has free will, and maybe they're not saved. Maybe maybe they've denied Jesus. Maybe they're they haven't agreed to be under uh, that authority. Uh, you can say that, and maybe God will help you. But it, it, you know, and. and but it's not like a guaranteed kind of deal, you know, um, like you, you, you think about the kids at Columbine, they had a gun held, held to their heads and they were asked, uh, you know, basically if you believe in Jesus and they said yes, and they got their heads blown off and it, it's a terrible situation. And, uh, actually my wife has a friend who was in the school while that happened and she really? was like in a chaotic state for like three days or something. Jeez. Yeah. It's, it's an awful, awful situation, but 
the, the, the fact is, like, hum, human beings, uh, you, you, if somebody is inclined to do so, if they haven't accepted Jesus, if they have, you know, you know, whatever the case may be, you can say in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave, and they might not do it. You know, they might not leave. But for some reason, any time that somebody has believed those words and actually used that in an abduction scenario or uh, or like a sleep paralysis deal, which those are very closely related. I haven't had the abduction stuff, but I've had a lot of the sleep paralysis stuff. And uh, hearing people like Joyce Aarons, who we also interviewed, uh, hearing her describe some of the things that 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 she was feeling like you just know something's wrong and something's going to happen, even though you're wide awake, you haven't even gone to bed yet. I know exactly what she's talking about. Uh, I, I know what that feeling is like. Um, but th- this goes back to the John Mack stuff. For some reason, there's those points of correlation and they're still they're held under uh, the authority of Jesus. So even though you know, me, you guys, Mike Heiser, Joe Jordan, you know, Gary Bates, L.A. Marzulli, Steve Quayle, who, whoever studies this stuff. We might disagree on some of the little particular things, but we all know how to make it stop. You know, and I, I think that's infinitely more important. It's the name and authority of Jesus Christ. And that tells you that it can't be extraterrestrial. If it was extraterrestrial, then they they would have free will just like we do. Why wouldn't they? You, you know, I mean, if we have it and we're the imagers of God here on this earth, of course, something else, you know, uh, there would be no reason to believe that they wouldn't have free will as well. Uh, they wouldn't be held under the, that, that same authority, but for some reason they are. So that tells that, that tells, <sighs> and it should, it should tell the ancient uh, aliens crowd something, but unfortunately MUFON being one of the biggest organization, well, the biggest or- organization that studies this stuff, you know, when somebody like Joe Jordan says, hey, I, I, I found a way to, to stop this. Have you guys heard of this, too? And then they say, yeah, we've heard of it, but we don't know what to do with it, so we just don't talk about it. Are you kidding me? Really? You can provide somebody, like, health and healing, and you, you can get somebody out of this thing. Who cares how weird it is? If it works, it works. Like, why not do that? And it's not uh, like it's not like it's not like MUFON is being a it, it's not like they're they're being a scientific they're looking at it scientifically i mean buffon no not if, not if they're look, having channelers and, and yeah right right look, look at the look well, at the that's, look at the last uh mufon symposium that they just did right rob did right. you want to ask uh, a question <laughs> um i did uh <laughs> no i just i i come from a more a more secular viewpoint not not like a not a not a crazy like oh this is all nuts and bolts and you know kind of a, a thing but i i did want to pose that maybe what if say um people who don't believe in christianity and sure. you know they, they experience this and they hear that people calling out to jesus can help but they're they're calling out to something that they don't believe in. There's no belief there. There's no passion. There's no yes. no intensity. That's, so yes. so my question is: What if it's just the the belief itself, not not the underlying what that belief might infer, but the, just the 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 faith and the passion itself that that drives us away? What if it's more of a psychological element, and it takes? I would, I- you know, yeah. it it takes a real uh, a real strong belief to to drive that that element sure. away. No, I totally get it, and I and and if there were other examples, and please, if anybody listening has any, I would like I would I would very much be interested in reading them, and and I'm not skeptical of this stuff. Like I I want to have as much information as I can so I can form you know a good hypothesis. Sure. Right. I, I personally haven't heard of anybody calling on Buddha or Allah or any other deity and been successful in stopping an experience. You, usually when that type of stuff happens, and, and this is, this is you know, generalizations, but usually when that type of stuff happens, the abduction experience continues. Now, I don't have any reason to believe that somebody in India, you know, somebody uh, who, I mean, they've had thousands of years of, you know, uh, you know, Indian beliefs and stuff, you know, this whole pantheon of gods and everything. There's no reason for me to believe that they don't fully and totally believe that that's, that, that, 
you know, that's real. And actually, we believe it's real, too. We just have a slightly different interpretation that that's not the all-powerful God. You know, the, 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 those are just kind of the, uh, well, I guess you could say fallen angels, but may, maybe Elohim is a better word. And, and mm-hmm. you know, there, there's we, we yeah. can get into that more. But Going but, back to Dr. Heiser's work on that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the level of faith, uh, shoot, a Christian would be dishonest if they say they've never doubted. I, I certainly have. I certainly have. I've I've doubted, and it would not surprise me if somebody of you know another religion, even though I believe that the the, the interpretation of that is, is is wrong, that maybe maybe they have stronger faith than me in in their thing. You know, I don't think I don't think it's a question of faith because I haven't. And, and again, if 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 people want to correct me, I would love to hear an experience where somebody called on Allah or somebody called on Buddha or the Krishna or, or any number of, of anything out there and have actually managed to stop because I I've heard, um, Oh, what's his name? Uh, David Jacobs. I've, I've heard him, I've heard him sort of say, well, you, you, you know, uh, when people call on Jesus, the thing is the abduction thing is already done and they're just kind of waking up and they're already leaving. And then they call on Jesus, but they're already kind of out the door kind of thing that doesn't add up. Well, he uh, thinks I, it's I, totally I, physical. I mean, he has, he's, yeah. it's totally material to him. So. Right. right and yeah. it, and it, in a way I agree with it in a way. I, I actually think that it's a, a, a lot more real and physical than what most people would think because the, the, the true extra dimensional hypothesis if you have a being that consists of more dimensions than three, just by nature, it's more physical, it's more real, but they also have extra dimensions that they can, that they have access to. You know, I think about how, how much more real we would be to a hypothetical two dimensional being, you know, a flatlander, if right. people are familiar with, with that analogy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, technically, if a flatlander were real, Technically, they're physical. They're real. They actually, they even technically exist in our three dimensions of, of space. They just they don't have access to one of them, but they still technically do at least to the the, the Planck length size. And if, you know, we we could get into all the all the quantum physics if, if if we want. But but basically, they they do still technically exist. Yet I have far more room. Uh, to occupy than they do. So it's very easy. It would be very easy for me to be outside of their line of sight. Well, it's the same with these beings, you know, just because they seem wispy and ghostly and ethereal to us doesn't mean they actually are. Actually, if anything, I think that that, uh, that, that lends itself more to the extra dimensional hypothesis. How, how else and, 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 and why, how else is an alien going to transport somebody through a wall? And even if they could do that, even if they could, why when there's a perfectly good door in the room, <laughs> you know, why expend all the energy and, and, <laughs> and all the technology it would take when there is a perfectly good door, it works fine, it, you know, they, they could use that, but they don't. They always go through doors and they go through wind, like through closed windows. I, I, I think that is evidence that we're talking about something extra dimensional here. Just like if I were interacting with a two dimensional being, I could lift him out of Flatland, out of his two dimensional universe, and to the rest of the Flatlanders, it would look like he disappeared because they don't have access to the third dimension. So, uh, anyway, yeah, I kind of got on the ramp there, but <laughs> let's. I want to. I want to go back a little bit to the the ancient aliens concept. Um, you guys do a good job, and Derek, I'm going to throw this over to you. Uh, tracing some of these beliefs you mentioned this as a kind of modern day theosophy um so let's i want to trace i'd like you to trace some of where these beliefs are coming from that has now kind of been like all of it has kind of been repositoried into the ancient aliens theory and as an extension to the overall ufo religion (laughs) <laughs> it, it's kind of an interesting uh, chain of events, and I, I have to give credit to a couple of researchers who really did a, the heavy lifting, and it was just by putting together the two pieces that they had a scene of the puzzle. Uh, one is Peter Lavenda, yeah. who I've interviewed him several times, and he's uh, written some some you know excellent books on the occult. Um, I think he, I've heard is, every interview you've done with him just about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fascinating stuff. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, uh, I, you know, I enjoy his work, would love him to put his, his mind to work for, for Jesus Christ. But, but I, I think he's really, at least the last time I talked to him, he was still convinced that you could, 
access the uh, the spirit plane through proper uh, purification and discipline. Um, well, he wrote the Necronomicon. We all know that. So we we th- that is yep, a fact. Yep. I'm I'm convinced that that I, I asked him about that once off uh, off mic off air, and he he denies it. But uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but he wrote a book several years ago that I found fascinating called The Dark Lord, which was about the um, influence of uh, chaos magic and, and the development of chaos magic, but specifically about the strange synchronicities between the work of Aleister Crowley and H.P. Lovecraft, who, uh, interestingly, was was an atheist. Uh, and when you piece that together with the work of Jason Colavito, who is a skeptic, uh, and showing how influential Lovecraft has been on the ancient aliens hypothesis. Right. It, it fits together. So you've got this weird picture of the ancient aliens hypothesis really being uh, theosophy filtered through Aleister Crowley and then ramped up uh, by H.P. Lovecraft <laughs> and, you know, really uh, t- that uh, w- which inspired uh, uh, Eric von Daniken to write Chariots of the Gods. Um, now, going back a little further into the actual uh, spiritual forces, if you will, behind all of this. I mean, I we, I go all the way back. We started in the book with the uh, um, the ancient um, Greek philosopher uh, Thales, who uh, in, invented the the scientific method, and and go from there. I'll, I'll spare listeners that because that gets a little dry. But when you get into the 18th century and you've got uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, who was raised a Christian, uh, and, and when he was about my age now, mid-50s, he suddenly began having these um, these visions and, and hearing voices. And he believed he was hearing from angels who lived on other planets in the solar system, Jupiter, Mars, and whatever. And he founded a church, which has still got a few members around today. They don't call themselves Swedenborgians anymore. I guess that didn't focus group very well. So they, they've changed it to the new church, I think. But you can still buy Swedenborg's books, you know, where he was hearing these messages from angelic beings on other planets. Okay, come into the 19th century. You've got the uh, spiritist movement that was started by the Fox sisters, which uh, they later admitted was a hoax, didn't dissuade true believers like uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who w- still believed that uh, he was, you know, it was possible to get messages from the dead through necromancy and, and mediums. Um, then you get Blavatsky, who broke with the spiritualists, who said, yeah, they're getting messages, but not very scientific about it. And it's not the spirits of the dead. It's the spirits of the masters of ascended wisdom who live on other planets out near Sirius. And they want to share information with us on how we can uh, spiritually evolve to the next level. And she came up with a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not an expert on Blavatsky, but her theosophical work was uh, partly um, cribbed from Sanskrit texts. I mean, she basically uh, plagiarized old uh, Hindu religious texts and mixed in some pseudo archaeology, like the uh, lost continent hypothesis of uh, uh, Lemuria and Atlantis, where humanity uh, or originated on Lemuria and uh, the the good and noble citizens of Lemuria fought these wars with the black magicians of Atlantis, and that led to various rises and crashes again in human history of uh, civilization. Um, so anyway, uh, it was a yeah. cycle of uh, evolution. There was also a um, lot of racism that was part oh, yeah. of that as well. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that's sort of implicit in in the whole ancient aliens thing too. That uh, the, hey, there's no we, re, way that those brown skinned Egyptians could have built those pyramids. You know, that had to be mm-hmm. astronauts from another planet. Mm-hmm. There's no way those brown skinned people in Central America could build Machu Picchu, or South America could build Machu Picchu, or the Temple of the Sun, whatever, uh, or or uh, you know Angkor Wat. You know, that had to be astronauts from an advanced civilization. Uh, so th- there's there's a bit of racism sort of implied in the whole ancient aliens theory that doesn't get talked about much on the History Channel. Right. Um, sound anyway, like my own uh, boss. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they even embrace that kind of stuff, like because with that whole Peruvian skeleton thing, uh, actually, Mike Heiser uh, shared a, a, an amazing article about how it was actually pretty disrespectful to the Peruvian culture to say that that was some sort of alien. And it did. Sure. To- I mean, it totally wasn't. I mean, it totally like I, I and we called it, of course, well, and any reasonable, any reasonable person would have anyway. <laughs> but within like a week, it was totally debunked. And somebody had like put something together. There were like, like what baby fingers or something in there. Oh, yeah. Or- yeah. Oh, you yeah. talked about the Nazca mummies. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 
it, that was pretty so, bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, you you get to the early 1900s. You get uh, H.P. Lovecraft, who was kind of building on the uh, the movement that uh, Blavatsky had started uh, you know, with her uh, magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, and Isis Unveiled, and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Crowley was was channeling spirits of ancient Egyptian gods. He believed. So there you get the ancient gods. Uh, you know, Harpur Krat, I think, was the one that he believed he was hearing from. Um, now Lovecraft, who came along. Uh, Later than than Crowley, Crowley was uh, the early part of the 20th century. He, he died in 1945, World War II. He actually outlived uh, 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 Lovecraft, but uh, Lovecraft wrote the Call of Cthulhu, which was the story that kind of made him famous um, and set up the description or the the kind of overarching title for all of his work as the uh, the Cthulhu Mythos. Uh, other authors borrowed from the monsters that he created and so forth, uh, and of course he created the idea of this this ominous grimoire, uh, the Necronomicon, which of course then Peter Lavenda back in the late seventies actually grabbed a bunch of old Babylonian ritual texts and, uh, created a Necronomicon that people can still buy. From, supposedly. Uh, supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Lovecraft was an atheist, considered himself a man of science, but as Lavenda points out in The Dark Lord, there are some parallels in what he was writing in 1926 in The Call of Cthulhu with what Crowley had been channeling into his Books of the Law for Telema back in 1907. Some really weird stuff, you know, I won't go into detail here, but uh, more than just coincidence. And so Kenneth Grant, who was Crowley's personal secretary, and later took Crowley's work and built on it, transformed it from Telema into the Typhonian order, named for the Greek god of chaos, Typhon, uh, believed that uh, Crowley and Lovecraft had actually been channeling the same spiritual entity, which Grant identified as this god of chaos, Typhon, or known as Set to the Egyptians, Leviathan in the Bible, Tiamat to the Sumerians, and so forth. This god of chaos is what Grant believed infused his magic, and so he believed that we had moved from the age or the eon of Horus into the eon of Typhon, the 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 age of chaos. And in fact, if you do a search on the web tonight for chaos magic, you can find all kinds of hits. People ready to teach you how to work chaos magic with a K. Um, oh man, yeah, I, I noticed that too in researching for this book and looking up the Leviathan Chaos stuff. There's so much of it. I got about ninety percent occultic stuff and about ten yep. percent Christian, and most yep. of that was from Mike Heiser. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Lovecraft created this whole strain of horror fiction. He didn't benefit from it much. He died poor, penniless, <laughs> practically. Yeah, but in World War II, the uh, United States Army sent out. Uh, copies of his book and a lot of pulp fiction to the soldiers to entertain them in the foxholes. Uh, that wound up in the hands of some of the people in France. Uh, suddenly, after the war, Lovecraft had a huge following in France, believe it or not. Lovecraft and Jerry Lewis, I guess. And <laughs> science fiction authors in France began compiling his works and republishing them in French, in French magazines and so forth. And a couple of French magazine pu uh, publishers named uh, Powell's and uh, Bergier kind of took some of the themes that Lovecraft had written about, like um, Cyclopean architecture, you know, megalithic structures built by mysterious ancient races. Oh, wait, maybe by ancient gods who are coming back someday. The pyramids were built. You know, all of the stuff that ancient aliens is broadcasting today, doing shows on. Uh, these guys in 1960 published a book called Morning of the Magicians or Dawn of Magic and sold a bunch of copies in Europe, was translated into English a few years later. Uh, and again, very heavily influenced by Lovecraft, who was, even though he was an atheist, was more than happy to draw on theosophy and some of the ideas that Blavatsky popularized and that Crowley developed, uh, you know, these ancient gods and mysterious rituals and, uh, uh, you know, the lost continents and so forth um, to, to sell, you know, stories to magazines. Uh, it, you know, he died in 1936 or thereabouts. So like 30 years later, these guys, Powell's and Bergier, kind of start a new genre of pseudo-archaeology. And like any other form of entertainment, whether it's music, movies, or literature, when you come up with a, something new that's selling, people will try to copy it. And so in 1970, a hotel manager from Switzerland more or less copies what Powell's and Bergier wrote, I mean, to the point where they threatened him with a lawsuit, and published Chariots of the Gods, 
which has now sold something like 60 million copies around the world and as the number one selling book of archaeology ever. That's that's and, awful. That's, that's just that's no, sad. Uh, yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> So there, there <laughs> that's the number chain. one selling book in archaeology and chariots of the yeah. gods. I, it, yep. Yeah, true. True story. It absolutely is. And uh, it's bizarre that it's Lovecraft through these French science fiction publishers and authors uh, that Von Daniken basically drew his inspiration. I mean, some of this stuff is so ridiculous that uh, Von Daniken, you know, admitted in an interview with Playboy magazine that he was getting some of his information by channeling stuff from like the fourth dimension. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, hey, if these are ancient astronauts that created the Nazca lines and presumably they have spacecraft that, you know, fly up and down, you know, vertical takeoff and landing, why do they need landing strips? Yeah, like <laughs> ro rockets from the nope. 1960s. I wanted to ask you, Derek, uh, just as an aside, I was thinking about this when I heard you on another show. Uh, the Morning of the, Ma of the Magicians, was that also where some of the Merovingian mythos you know the bloodline of jesus stuff started as well i don't know if they dug into that or if that came later with um oh gosh in fact i was just talking about this the other night uh with um what the dan brown stuff yeah but dan brown yeah the uh, holy because, blood holy grail stuff right right um a lot of that was borrowed from uh gnosticism it, it was uh, and th that stuff was that came from uh uh, Bajent and Lee, who wrote uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, but they got their stuff from the, the Priory of Science stuff that was a, a pro shown to be a hoax. Yeah. Right. Yeah, French guy who basically hoaxed the idea of the Priory of Science back in the, uh, oh gosh, 40s and 50s. So I'm not sure if Powell's and Bergier picked up on that or not. They may have, but. Um, yeah, I was just curious about that. And I'm just I'm trying to think, who did I talk to about this the other? Oh, I was talking to a fellow about a, a book on the. Uh, the new age Jesus refuting the idea that Jesus, you know, went to India or was a vegetarian or stuff, you know, who is that? <laughs> Who'd you interview? Uh, Jack, uh, Davila Ashcraft. Is that on your uh, view from the bunker? Not yet. It will be in another week or so. I so want the link to that because that goes into some research that, uh, I'm involved in now, but anyway, I don't want to deviate from the conversation. You, okay. <laughs> you also have, you also have, uh, Andrea Puharich as well on the nine. Yeah. And I think that's that's important. That's I see that all over the place. Well, again, credit where it's due. Peter Lavenda is the one who tipped us off to the nine. That was one of the uh, subtitles of the books uh, in his uh, Sinister Forces trilogy. Uh, yes. Puharich w was a, uh, a trained psychologist who went to work uh, a, 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 more of a parapsychologist, really, uh, went to work for the intelligence community in the 1950s, researching psychic abilities. Um, you know, I guess the Russians were doing it. We, we couldn't allow uh, the United States to have a <laughs> psychic gap. So we needed to <laughs> look for psychics as well. But through a series of circumstances, he wound up uh, in Maine one New Year's Eve with a group of rather wealthy people and a, an Indian medium uh, I, I known only to history as Dr. Vinod, I think. And uh, they contacted or were contacted by a group of entities that identified themselves as the nine. Well, they made repeated contact. And some of the people involved in these sessions over time were some very, very wealthy old money types. I mean, members of the Astor family and the uh, 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 Forbes family. Uh, the, the inventor of the Bell helicopter was, was one. Uh, as time went on and we got, uh, you know, because this was back in the early 50s when they had their first session. But the, the nine or the group that... Uh, uh, contacted, communicated with the nine, met uh, into the 70s with a kind of a rotating cast of people who would come and attend these seances with this group. Uh, Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek, was uh, a member of this group that was right. in communication with the nine for a while. Right. That's so very not, interesting. I, I know, isn't it? Uh, not a coincidence that Deep Space Nine was one of his creations, and that particular series had a very strong theological story arc with Commander Sisko being, uh, you know, the prophesied uh, savior of the Bajorans. Um, but at, over time, it uh, was revealed that uh, the nine, who they believed were extraterrestrials and orbiting the Earth in some spa in spacecraft, were actually the Aeneid, the nine principal gods from the Egyptian pantheon at Heliopolis. Hmm. 
and that the the leader of this group who identified himself first as Tom was actually Atum, the creator god of the Egyptians. So again, you've got this idea, which is a theme that keeps coming back, and, and it's repeated in the modern ancient alien hypothesis, that the gods of the ancient world were nothing but extraterrestrials, aliens who overawed our ancestors with their superior technology. Yeah, and we posit in the book that maybe it's not that ancient you know, gods were mistaken for, you know, uh, extraterrestrials back in antiquity, but maybe we are mistaking ancient gods for extraterrestrials today. Right. I wanted to add something about the nine. I found this very interesting. You talk about science fiction. We talk about how some of this stuff influences science fiction and science fiction in turn influences this material. Uh, there's a movie that came out about 10 years ago called I Am Number Four. Yep. And in that movie, supposedly this kid, he learns that he's an alien and he's left here. And there's this other alien that helps him out, right? This girl. Well, you in one part of the movie towards the end, you find out that there's nine of them that were put on Earth. Hmm. And I immediately, I actually was reading Peter Lavinda's book at the time when I, when I saw that. <laughs> I was like, that is extremely interesting. So this stuff does go into science fiction. It's there. Well, yeah. And nine is a very magical number throughout a lot of cultures. And right. And I, <clears throat> um, you know, that's the three times three, three being the magic number of a lot of cultures throughout a lot of histories. So right. I, I think it does find its way into a lot of things. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And some of the weird stuff too, is the, the, the connections between the nine and uh, the, the John F. Kennedy assassination, mm -hmm. which we just touch on again, Peter Lavenda highly recommend his series, uh, sinister forces because he goes into some deep detail on those weird connections. I mean, that's just beyond belief. You guys do spend a whole chapter in the book, and I think this is primarily your chapter, Josh, um, about Podesta's WikiLeaks. So we're getting yes. more to the to the here and now. Uh oh, uh, the some of the stuff that came out. You do a pretty good job of looking at this, and just this is just a kind of a milieu of just weird beliefs. That Interesting are, choice in words. You must be right. that I watch TV follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just people that have. It, well, you can explain it. You know, Edgar Mitchell, and trying to get Podesta's attention, and just some of the it just flat out weirdness. I mean, talk about UFO religion. Yes. I mean, this is what this is. Well, that that is exactly what it is, and whether Podesta knows it or not, he is involved in a religion. It's a belief system. It's not. It, it's not. And here, here's the proof of it. It's not based on empirical data. It's not based on scientific findings. Now, if you were to ask him, I would suspect that he probably would say that it is. He, he probably would say, as many of them do, he probably would say that no, we are looking at the science. We're looking at it scientifically. But here's the proof. Uh, at least in Podesta's case, John Podesta's case, why that that's not so. Um, he had contact. He had contact with a whole lot of people, and I'm telling you guys, I have read every single one of his emails that WikiLeaks <laughs> released, and there are way too many for me to read, to for for me to be reading and be like a a, a normal person. But I you, you, to you must it. have been really <laughs> bleary eyed, Josh. You must. Have. Oh my gosh, I'm telling you, just this. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's rough. But I you know, so the 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 weird thing is he actually didn't he actually didn't respond to too many people. And you know, that's to right. be expected. You know, right. when when you when you have a high status, you, you you get a lot of emails and you don't respond to many of them. You you, you know. Um so in his emails, he did respond at first uh, and it's still saying something with uh, Edgar Mitchell. Uh, he was an Apollo 14 astronaut. He was the sixth man to walk on the moon. Uh, and he was, uh, he, he's passed now. He, you know, he died. But, um, but at the time, 
he was working with uh, Terry Mansfield, who is basically, I guess, an alien channeler. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, I, I, I swear, you look at her website, it, it is I, I just people will have to go and look at it themselves or read the book, actually, even better yet, because we just went ahead and published all this stuff. We, we just because took all- it's always your most reliable source are the channeled aliens. That's always the most reliable I, well, source. Yeah, I mean. And yeah. that's the weird thing. That was what John Podesta responded to. Now, he did have people like uh, Bob Fish. And, uh, you know, th- this, is, this, is, this, this isn't this is like a nobody. Th- th- this is actually, you know, he, he was, he's pretty prominent in this stuff. And he was trying to get John Podesta's attention. Because just for some backstory for those who don't know, John Podesta, he, he, he's like – in the DNC and he worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign. He worked with Barack Obama. He actually even tweeted out that the biggest failure was he couldn't get the Obama administration to release anything, uh, for official disclosure and all that. Uh, we document all that in the book, but so, uh, that that's basically John Podesta. He's been a champion for official disclosure for a long time. Uh, that's like his main deal, but he's all, he's also held, high status in, in, in the government and really even in the public. I mean, the Pizzagate thing kind of, kind of messed them up a little bit for good reason. But, uh, but besides that, I mean, he, he's out there. People know who he is. You know, you, you can ask anyone on the street who's John Podesta and they'll, they'll at least be able to tell you Pizzagate. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll be able to say, well, <laughs> Clinton, something, something with kids. I don't know. You know, they'll, be, they'll at least be able to tell you something. Um, so he's a well-known name. Uh, so Bob Fish emailed him that I, and actually, you know, I read, I read all seriously, every email that was released by WikiLeaks I've read. Uh, the only one that I thought, Hey, you know, here's maybe something that makes sense was from this Bob Fish guy. Uh, and, and again, this isn't just some nobody that was emailing him. Th- those emails don't get released because who cares? It, it, it's just it's it's nothing. You know, I, I get a bunch of emails, and like ten percent of them uh, are, are, are usually it's people who want me to like get a book to Tom Horn or they they want something from me. Th- those those emails with the WikiLeaks those don't really get released. I'm sure there are thousands of other emails that John Podesta has received that just don't get released because it doesn't matter. Right. Um, anyway. Bob Fish was trying to give John Podesta some advice because Podesta is in a position where he he could actually look this stuff up. You know, here here's how to scientifically look at the the, the this question of aliens. Uh, you know, may, may, maybe look look at look at how many reports there are a year and see if there's a certain point. Uh, within the year where there's more reports than other points. And then, you know, may, maybe he had all these really scientific, good uh, arguments, good, good, good ways of looking at the question, you know, scientifically, objectively. Um, he, w- he did not respond to that. He sent it to his secretary. He said, FYI, and that's it. That was it. Now, Edgar Mitchell comes along and Terry Mansfield, and they are in contact for a couple of years. And zero evidence, nothing scientific. Uh, and it's basically Terry Mansfield and I, you know, this is, you know, Edgar uh, Mitchell. Terry, Terry Mansfield and I are in contact with these things and they work with us. And, you know, they actually are from, uh, they, they say contiguous universe. We would think of that as like a parallel universe, maybe a higher reality. Right. <laughs> uh, the way they describe it is, is more akin to a higher reality than a parallel universe. But, um, you know, we're in contact with these things and here's what they tell us. They tell us all the, all these things, zero Scientific evidence, nothing substantial. Yet right. that is what gets John Podesta's attention. And the reason that that is so important is if official disclosure does happen, and I, I, I kind of think that we're starting to sort of see the beginning of that now, uh, you know, at least within the past month or so, uh, with this whole, you know, Pentagon thing that came out. And but, but, yeah. but it, it, I want to get to that, but we'll get to that. But yeah, but but it's the first time in history where the the major news agencies are actually taking this topic seriously, you, you, you know. Um, so 
I, I, I mean, I, I saw Leslie Keen on uh, Tucker Carlson uh, of all places, and he was actually taking it seriously. There, there wasn't, you know, you didn't hear the X Files music in the background. There was no laughing. Uh, Tucker was just seriously like, "Why, why is the government keeping this from us? I, I want to know what's going on." And they weren't even going as far as to say it's aliens. But, but, but that, that, that's a whole separate topic. Um, in, in the book, that was before all this broke, and. Uh, in the book, we talked about that, I, I believe, and you know, I think that's been substantiated, that we're on the cusp of a type of official disclosure event. Now, I don't know how it's going to manifest. I don't know to what severity. You, you know, I mean, likely it, it it's not going to answer people's questions. It's not going to be this moment in history where, oh, now we know. It's not going to be that. What it's going to be is maybe – some stuff gets released, and then we have more questions than we ever did before. Um, the reason that the Podesta emails are so important in that is because when these things are released, people like Podesta or like Leslie Keene or like all, all the people who are really, really heavy into the disclosure movement now, I'm not even saying the disclosure movement is necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it, it, it just it, it depends on what the information is. If it's secret technology, then I don't think the public should know about it because I don't want our enemies to know about it. But if it is some weird <laughs> phenomenon that the government doesn't know what to do with, then yeah, tell us. You know, maybe somebody else has another idea about it. But anyway, um, when information comes out, like was 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 proven in that uh, Tucker Carlson interview, and uh, uh, you know, met, met many others that followed. The people who have been studying UFOs, who have been the forefront of the official disclosure movement, uh, even people like Tom DeLong, the, the, the lead singer of Blink-182, and there's a whole backstory to that. But those are going to be the people that the media will call on, and that's how the, the, the actual facts are going to be interpreted for the rest of us. You know, We're going to get the interpretation and a little bit of the facts. Um, I mean, you just think of any, any, anything that happens in the world, anything in geopolitics. You have a fact, but then you have news organizations interpreting it for you. You know, you can have the same fact from Fox News and from CNN, and you're going to get two very different stories. <laughs> so it's going to be the same deal. So it's important to know now what the, 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 the people that are in the forefront of the official disclosure movement, what they think about this, how they interpret this phenomenon. I don't think you can trust John Podesta, and he he if if the Pizzagate thing didn't hurt him enough, um, if, if people are still willing to take him seriously, and if this official disclosure thing happens soon enough, uh, news agencies are going to be calling him and asking him, and he'll say uh, 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 a whole bunch of times. Listen to any interview with him; it is so annoying. But anyway, <laughs> he does he does that a lot. He stutters a lot. Uh, I, I I do too. So maybe I'm being a little hypocritical, but. He has a higher status than I do, so it's okay. But anyway, so um, people are going to be calling on him to say, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for Earth? And he's going to say things like Edgar Mitchell believed and Terry Mansfield does still believe, like contiguous parallel realities. Uh, they're more powerful than us, but they don't mean us harm. They want to help us. They're just, they're just waiting for us to ask for help. Like we haven't been doing that for thousands of years and all, all this ridiculous stuff I actually have in the book. I, I listed out, um, j just to kind of bring it all home. I, I listed out 20 things. I'm not going to read them all here, but I listed out 20 things that we can learn from the Podesta emails in terms of how. Uh, presumably Podesta and definitely Edgar Mitchell and Terry Mansfield interpret this phenomenon. And none of it, not a single shred of it is based on anything scientific or empirical. It's all based on interpretation and it's all based on what Terry Mansfield says that these beings have told her. And right, right. I, it's just, it, exactly. it, 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 yeah. So this is how it's going to be interpreted to the world. And if you have a major event, even if it's not some news leak, maybe just like our, our, our book title suggests, or at least is, uh, uh, you know, kind of riffing off of, even if it's something as extreme as beings touched down on the White House lawn, it's still going to be interpreted for us. Okay, beings 
whatever, aliens, whatever. They land on the White House lawn. Where are you going to go for information about that? You're going to go to the internet and you're going to go to the news. You're, you're, you're going to go to you know Fox or CNN or MSNBC or whatever. And you're going to go to the internet. So already, and most of those, but that's actually the only reason I sort of like some of what Fox News, well, I certainly like Tucker Carlson, but some of what Fox News does is because they'll at least admit to a bias. But most of these uh, organizations don't even admit that they're biased. They just say that, you know, they're the most trusted name in news and they, do, they don't have a, ba uh, a bias. We all have a bias. Every single one of us. Well, I certainly do. Derek and I definitely have a bias in this book. Sure. And we were very e upfront everybody and honest does. about it. Well, I'm going to say this about what's going on. We, we, you know, we also have Tom DeLong in these emails. That was the one yep. thing that I remember specifically about them was the, the, was the whole Tom DeLong thing that he got outed before you know, he was planning his whole secret machines and to the stars Academy and all that. Yeah. We published all that, by the way, right. if anybody's interested in the details of his secret projects, buy our book, we got it all in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the, and I think that you guys would agree with me. I believe, and I've thought this for some time. I think the Tom DeLong as well has been saying this, the narrative is changing yes. from extraterrestrial to interdimensional. Yes. yes. And that's why yes. you, you you brought up earlier uh, shows. Um, what was what was the, the the movie or the show that you brought up earlier? Um, I am number I'll, four. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever the show was uh, or, or movie that you brought up earlier about aliens and stuff, there there have been other attempts at that, like mm -hmm. uh, Star Crossed on CW. It's basically about oh oh uh, I am number four. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. You know that was actually supposed to be a trilogy, and they never made another movie. Right, because the I don't think it did well in the in the box no. office. Yeah, no, and the the reason that it didn't do well, and it's gonna, it, it might take Hollywood a couple of years to to, to realize this. Uh, same reason why Starcrossed on CW didn't do well is because they're still stuck in the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and more more people are thinking extra dimensional hypothesis. Once they start a right. show that deals with the extra dimensional stuff, that will do really well because. Again, this phenomena follows the culture, and the culture is more into that now mm -hmm. than it is. You know, the extraterrestrial hypothesis is is just kind of like uh, so you know, 20th century. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like we we as Christians would say, oh, well, that's just your grandpa's stuff. Yeah, I, it, it's it's not it's not really relevant anymore because there's so much debunking it. There's so much. I mean, when when people first started having abduction experiences, these so-called aliens would say that they're from the moon or the sun of all places uh, or uh, <laughs> Venus. But now exactly, that we've been yeah, able, the the yeah. whole uh, the Adamski stuff, yeah. where the women from Venus, and right, right, right. Oh my gosh, yeah. Now that now that we actually know quite a bit about those planets and know that nothing. You, you can't even have metal on Venus. Like it, ju it's just going to melt and be destroyed. How are you going to build a spaceship on Venus? It will just <laughs> melt. <laughs> so then for a little while, they were saying, well, we're from Zeta Reticuli and we're from Arcturus and you right. know, all this stuff. But now we actually have quite a bit of data on exoplanets and we have not found a single remotely habitable one yet, even though they want to say, oh, Goldilocks zone. You know, technically yeah. Venus point, is in Josh. the Goldilocks zone. Huh? Good point. Good point. Yeah, That's Venus point. technically is in the Goldilocks zone of our solar system, and that is not a habitable planet at all. Uh, so the Goldilocks zone doesn't mean anything. Um, but, but so, you know, these beings have kind of realized that. So now, within the past five, maybe ten years they started to change their story well now it's contiguous universes now it's parallel realities and higher dimensions and it's it's all this weird ethereal you listen to like uh david wilcock and Corey good which i cannot believe that I, well i can believe it but i can't <laughs> believe that 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 show cosmic disclosure does as well as it does for one thing it's not very well filmed uh, I, I could do better in my basement, but even, even besides that, just the content, there is no proof. It's literally, what other crazy story do you have? Josh, Peck, any Josh Peck just called out Corey Good on Conspiranormal. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Give me one, give me one shred of evidence. Are we going to have a have a rap I battle? Happy, 
I am yeah. happy. I am happy to listen to it if he can give me. Same with David Wilcock because he's channeling aliens and he's he, he he's like shaking on the floor and doing. All, give me one shred <laughs> of objective <laughs> empirical evidence, and I might start to take it seriously. I would love you know, and, to. I honestly, and, and the to, irony here. The, the yeah. irony here is that when we as Christians come forward and say, you know, we, we've got an alternative explanation yep. for the uh, messages that contactees and abductees have been receiving from these entities, uh, we will often get laughed at by people in the UFO community. It's like, oh, come on, that's totally unscientific. Uh, look, what it comes down to is this. The information that they're getting is completely unverifiable. It is unverifiable. I mean, if we posit that these entities have the technology to move, whether it's across the stars or between dimensions, why then do they not have the capability to open up a webcam, use Skype, and contact somebody with a network communication and basically open a channel of communications, <laughs> open a hailing frequency, modulate a laser beam, you know, Morse code, something other than <laughs> telepathy to somebody whose information cannot be verified? Well, Derek, yeah. it's obviously because they're blue avians and they want to put these spheres <laughs> in our solar system. So then when we go through this cosmic destruction force that's going to hit us in a couple of years, we'll be safe from it. The, the, oh, the, blue, avi it? the blue avians <laughs> are trying to help us, Josh. I yeah, thought it was don't you get it, Derek? Man. Jeez, you're so 20th no. century. <laughs> I, I am, you know, insisting on stuff like evidence. But, but here, here's the thing. <laughs> Here, here's the thing. By contrast, by contrast, the claims of Christianity, the truth claims of Christianity, actually occurred in front of multiple witnesses. Yes. First Corinthians 15 is a remarkable chapter, one of the most remarkable in the Bible for somebody like me, because I had to see the evidence. I had to be convinced that this thing that we call the Bible was actually true and not just a bunch of myths and fairy tales that have been changed over the centuries to suit the whims of whatever pope or president or king happened to be in power at the time. Uh, that happens not to be the case, by the way. First um, Corinthians 15, Paul writing to the church at Corinth about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ writes to the church at Corinth, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand or by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received from the apostles, Paul and James, when he went to visit them after his conversion, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now here's the key part, the takeaway, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. In other words, what he was telling the church at Corinth was this. If you don't believe me, send someone to Jerusalem and ask around, because more than 500 witnesses saw this guy die and come back from the dead. Yes. Corroboration. You know Multiple witnesses who could corroborate the story. Yeah. Even Paul, in the book of Galatians, his letter to the church at Galatia, told them, hey, uh, you know, I went and I spent 15 days in, in Jerusalem with, with James and, and John and Peter. He was basically going there to check up on the story that the guys in Damascus had given him after his conversion on the Damascus Road. So that is a key difference, a key difference between the truth claims of Christianity and the truth claims of those who believe we're being contacted by entities who want to help us. Their yes. stories aren't corroborated, and they're often contradictory. Are Martian, yes, it's, Martian it, it's super not, soldiers that go back in time to the point where they were taken and, you know, it gets real right, complicated. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's, uh, in, in the case of the one lady who was on, I noticed she's not on the list of uh, inner circle members, by the way, for MUFON anymore. After That was kind of outed after last summer's uh, uh, symposium. Uh, the one who's channeling the 36,000-year-old uh, Lemurian warrior, Ramtha, the Enlightened One. Oh, uh, Jay Z Knight. Z Knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah she was well, on the inner circle. I noticed she's not listed there anymore. But anyway, Derek, uh, you put it really well in your dedication at the beginning of the book. Hmm. You say, in memory of my dad, Paul Bailey Gilbert, who read Chariots of the Gods and decided that believing Von Daniken required more faith than believing the apostles. <laughs> That's true. Uh, dad was an engineer and he wanted, uh, <laughs> He wanted the evidence, you know, how do I get from point A to point B? And he read Chariots of the Gods. He read Gold of the Gods. He read, um, 
the Passover plot and all kinds of other alternative explanations. He finally, you know, in the last couple of weeks of his life back in 2005, said, you know, I thought about all that stuff. And it finally dawned on me that believing those other conspiracy theories that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, in spite of the fact that the Romans were professional executioners, that the, uh, that somehow the Christian faith survived beyond the end of the first century in spite of brutal persecution from not only the Roman Empire, but from the Sanhedrin, the religious leadership in Jerusalem, which is where this cult of Christianity started. The fact that it survived said there were too many people who'd seen what had happened to stamp it out. And to me, that verse seven there, that Jesus appeared to James was key when I was trying to figure out why I believe, why I should believe the Bible. When you read the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 5, you see that even Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. Well, James was one of his brothers. But seeing your dead brother come back to life, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, that might affect your, that for me, that was like a light switch flipping. Yeah. Reading, reading the account in Josephus of the martyrdom of James around the year 63 A.D., James, 30 years after the resurrection, was so convinced that his brother was God mm. that he was martyred rather than recant. So, you know, that's an, I ex that's an extra biblical source. Yeah. And, yeah. and Josephus was a Pharisee, so he didn't have a dog in the hunt. He was not there to promote. To promote this cult of Christianity to him, it was a cult. Well, I mean, but it, he was it was, history. It was he the was same. reporting history. It was the same way with me. I mean, when I became a Christian, I was, you know, it was, it was honestly, I, I had been so into the UFO stuff that I, that I just one day just said to myself, look, I, I believe all this weird stuff. Why can't I believe a guy rose from the dead? It was just <laughs> as simple as that for me. And that was it. Uh, well, uh, I like the way Guy Malone puts it. He says, you know, that's the price of admission to this, uh, this crazy faith we call Christianity. You're supposed to, it's supposed to make more sense from there, you know? Yeah. I've told Guy that story too. Yeah. 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 You, you know what the, the amazing thing about Christianity is it's not all rooted in subjective truth. Like a lot of, a lot of people think a lot of people pick up the Bible and they think, okay, well, this is just a book with words and, you know, people wrote it a long time ago, but we're really disconnected from all that. No, 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 no. What was written that long ago really does resonate empirically and objectively into our day today. What one of the most, and it's weird that I'm promoting this guy so much now because I, I, I've known about him for for years, and until now, uh, it comes up almost every interview that I do. But Lee Strobel, uh -huh. uh, Case for Christ. If people want to know the empirical, objective evidence for not just that Christ existed. I mean, that that's pretty clear. I mean, he existed. Mo, mo, most atheists will even concede that. But that he was exactly what he said he was. And it is more than just the C.S. Lewis, you know, he'd have to be a madman or a liar. It, it's more than that, if, the, if that's what people are thinking. Look up Lee Strobel's case for Christ. Yep, and I'm familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he, here's a guy who started off, you know, an atheist trying to disprove this stuff empirically and objectively. Seems like it should be a pretty easy thing, you know. You you, you take any religion, and that would be a, a pretty easy thing because a lot of religions are based in uh, like subjective things. And he, so he thought that's what he was going to do because you know his wife became a Christian and was causing problems and you know all this stuff. Amazing story, but. He, he came out of that only looking at the, uh, the empirical data. He, he came out of that becoming a Christian because he realized, kind of like you know Derek's, uh, Derek's dad said, that, that, that it, it takes more faith to believe that Jesus, after all the data is compiled and you can see it all, it takes more faith to believe that he was actually the Son of God than anything else. And uh, I don't know, that, that, that to me is pretty phenomenal. That, that's... That's pretty amazing, and I think that's what we as Christians have above any other religion because it's mm. it's more than just a subjective belief. I mean, it's it's rooted empirically in objective truth. And when you start digging into the Bible, this goes back to my previous book, the uh, the Great Inception, and you see that there are events in the Bible that only really make sense if you understand 
them in the context of what the pagans around ancient Israel believed, like the parting of the Red Sea or the confrontation on Mount Carmel or why Jesus climbed Mount Hermon, specifically Mount Hermon, right. for the transfiguration. Um, if those gods of the ancient world were just imaginary, then the God of the Bible was playing along with the joke because he was doing things, he did things in history that only make sense as responses to what those small g gods or fallen angels, if you prefer, were teaching their followers. Well, guys, cl- kind of closing this out because we're getting towards the end here. Uh, I want to get your thoughts because you guys released this book. And not too long after, as Josh already talked about, we get all these revelations. The New York <laughs> Times article, the Tic Tac, mm-hmm. the famous Tic Tac video. We did not see that coming, by right. the way. Like that that took us by by surprise. Yeah. Too. Tom yeah, Horn was, totally Tom Horn set it up totally. It's part of the marketing plan. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it was it was very interestingly coincidental, I, I I thought. And so what's gonna what do you think is gonna happen? Are we getting some well, kind of some kind of soft disclosure? Is it going to be more just you know because things go in the news cycle and people people are interested in it for a couple of days? And I'm talking about people that don't follow this stuff. They mm-hmm. you know they they'll see it, they think it's interesting, and then something will happen. You know, Trump will say something or whatever, and then you know it, it'll <laughs> just it, it'll just it'll just go off. It, it, that's how it works. But, you know, I, I've in touch with someone that we've had on this show, and this person seems to think that he that they are that this is this is this is the only the first step, the the New York Times article, the Tic Tac video, yeah. that we're gonna get more in twenty eighteen. It's gonna be like a snowball effect. Well, so what I do you think is gonna happen, I'll, guys? Yeah, I'll I'll give my quick two cents and then I'll pass it off to Derek because he know he 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 knows factually a lot more about this than I do. But I I believe based on I, I even hesitate to say predictions. Like I don't even really like that word. But just just the same that like an economist can kind of predict the stock market and you know can maybe guide you in what stocks to buy, what might do okay, and what might not. God can do anything. Anything can happen. You know, any, anything can happen. But based on certain trends that uh, I've, I've laid out in the, la- the last chapter of the book, certain pa- for, for some reason, for some reason, and again, this kind of lends to the idea that it's more than just extraterrestrials, because w- what would extraterrestrials care about Israel? But for some reason, major events in Israel's history correlate with major events in UFO history or alien, you know, a- anything that promotes the idea of life, el- uh, you know, elsewhere in the universe, um, cosmic plurality. That's like the, the technical term for it. But, uh, for some reason those correlate. So I mapped them all out last chapter of the book. I mapped all those out and then I, I, I speculated. And again, it's not a prophecy. It's not a prediction. It's a, it, I, technically, I guess it's a prediction, but it very well could be wrong. Um, I just I hesitate to use that word within a Christian crowd because it means something different for us than it does uh, in the secular world. But um, you know, I, I, I speculate in the book, and again, this is literally like one week before, uh, maybe not even that, maybe a few days. It was before, pretty close. Yeah, I, I, I speculated in the book if these trends continue. And again, it would take me an hour to go through all of them. So just people can either email me. I'm happy to give the information for free or they'll have to get, they'll have to get the book at officialdisclosure.com. But if these trends continue, we should expect to see something, maybe the beginning of something bigger, but something at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, somewhere in this three to four month region. One week after the book is released, <laughs> that's yeah. exactly what we got. So yes, I do ju- just 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 based on my own research, I do believe this is the beginning. Now, are we going to see official disclosure in 2018? It wouldn't surprise me if we did, but I'm also not going to predict that. Um, I think that there's a lot that would have to come out. Uh, th- there's just a lot of different factors that I detail heavily in the book. Uh, and, and it, it, it's, it's certainly possible, but I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, kind of like you said before, I, I, I think we're on, I, I think we've been in soft disclosure for a while, but I think this is 
the first step uh, transitioning the culture from soft disclosure to hard disclosure. You know, uh, so, so, something that's just kind of generally known to something where all of a sudden the, the, the news is taking it seriously. I think we'll likely see more of that in 2018. Now, maybe it could be this big, you know, th th this big deal where, you know, it's just our new reality that we're sharing space with these beings. I, I'm, I'm skeptical about that. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be like that. Uh, could be, but, um, and, and I go through several reasons, uh, different scenarios on the, you know, the way that it could pan out in the book. But I, I think at the very least, based on, just major, and I'm telling you that that Trump naming, and I didn't know that it was going to be this, but Trump na like actually holding to the idea that not even the idea, just the fact that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, first president ever that has actually like held to that in modern, you know, it was you know within the past couple of decades or whatever, not just said it and then it fades off into history, but it is actually doing something about it, withholding funding from the UN. I mean, that is huge. And awesome. <laughs> you know, I love that. Um, major event, for some reason, major events having to do with Israel correlate with major events having to do with aliens, UFOs, just the uh, cosmic plurality, the, the, the idea that life exists somewhere else in the universe. So, yes, I, I, I think we're going to see more of that. I think it's going to be taken more seriously. I don't know if 2018 is the year for official disclosure or not. It wouldn't surprise me if it did happen. But at the same time, I'm wary about that major step happening so quick. But again, every time that I've been wary about things and, and thought that have you know things would take longer than they would, they've almost always certainly taken a, a much shorter amount of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Derek after that. He's got a lot more to add to this, but that, that's kind of my stance on it. Well, I've written an article for next month's Skywatch TV magazine about the incident. What the New York Times published on December 16th was two, two things. First, revelation that the Pentagon had been running a secret program to investigate UFOs, UFOs, UFO sightings from uh, 2007 through 2012. And the main source for the article was a gentleman named Luis Elizondo, who was a former Defense Intelligence Agency um, official uh, who'd been given a budget of about $22 million. It was put into the defense authorization bill by Senator Harry Reid, retired Senator Harry Reid from Nevada. Uh, maybe not coincidentally, most of that 22 million wound up in the hands of Robert Bigelow's Bigelow Aerospace, uh, he was a friend, is a friend, supporter of Harry Reid's, uh, owner of Skinwalker Ranch, and a long time, um, he has got a long time interest in the UFO phenomenon. He's the guy behind the Budget Hotel or Budget Inns uh, uh, Hotel or Budget Suites Hotels, I guess. Um, but Bigelow Aerospace, a contractor for the U.S. government, Harry Reid gets him $22 million. Not a coincidence also that Area 51 is located in Harry Reid's home state of Nevada. Um, now, Elizondo, in describing the program, also brought to the New York Times the story of an account that is now being called the USS Nimitz UFO incident. This occurred on November 14th of 2004. A couple of FA-18 pilots from the Nimitz, the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, on a training mission west of San Diego, about 100 miles offshore, were contacted by the USS Princeton, which is a guided missile carrier. They said, hey, look, we're getting these weird radar signals, something is descending from somewhere to about 80,000 feet, then it descends rapidly to 20,000 feet and then hovers. And then it either descends below radar range or shoots straight back up again. Can you please investigate? And oh, by the way, do you have any live ordnance on board? Which the two pilots did not. Uh, one of the pilots interviewed by the Times, uh, Commander David Fraber, uh, said when they got to the site that they were directed to by the Princeton, and they didn't see anything on their onboard radar, but he did see what looked like an area of churning water in the ocean. And he described this area as between 50 and 100 meters across. That's, you know, 150 to 300, 320 feet across. That's a huge area. Fravor said he thought they had just come onto the site of a downed commercial airliner. And then he noticed this thing hovering about 50 feet above the ocean. So he began to circle down to this thing. It began to climb toward him. 
he broke off his circular descent and aimed for it. Then it took off and it outran the Hornet, his F-18. So he and his wingman, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Jim Slate, decided to um, rendezvous at the cap point. That was about a, a position about 60 miles away. And then the radar operator from the Princeton contacted them again and said, you're not going to believe this, but that thing is already at the cap point. Now, according to Fravor, it was less than a minute. They were still 40 miles out. And this thing covered 60 miles in less than a minute. Now, if we even round up the speed to a full minute, just to make the math easy, that's a speed of 3,600 miles per hour to cover that 60 miles in a minute. Jeez. That's that's more than three times faster than the maximum speed of the F-18F Super Hornet that Commander Fravor was flying. It is half again as fast as the fastest aircraft known to man, which is the SR-71 Blackbird. Maximum speed about 2,200 miles an hour. So this thing moved in a hurry. Now, these two guys, uh, Slight and, and Fravor, were nearly out of fuel, so they returned to the Nimitz. Another training flight equipped with uh, infrared what they called forward-looking infrared radar uh, sensor pods took off and were directed back to that area, and they encountered it. And that's where that video that you've seen was uh, captured with that infrared radar. But you'll notice the infrared, which senses heat, didn't detect any kind of exhaust coming out of that thing. Okay, right. That would have li- that would have lit up like a like a flare, like a flamethrower coming out if it was using uh, hot gas exhaust to move at that speed. So. Whatever they saw was not being powered by rocket fuel, jet fuel, or anything like that. Don't know what it was. They never did get a close enough look to really identify what it was. Now, two points. First of all, that doesn't necessarily mean that's extraterrestrial. Just because exactly. those pilots didn't know what it was does not mean it came from outside the solar system. Yep. Um, a lot of pilots working for the United States military had no idea what the, uh, say, the, the stealth fighter was before it was deployed in the, in the first Gulf War. So we don't need to make the assumption that just because this was not something that they identified, uh, that, that it was necessary extraterrestrial. Secondly, this was not exactly a secret in the UFO community before the New York Times published the story in December. Somehow that video from the infrared sensors of the F-18 had been put up, had been uploaded to YouTube by about 2007. There was a story published about this incident on a website called uh, Fighter Sweep, which is written by and for fighter pilots back in March of 2014. And the author of that piece said he had contacted Commander Fravor a month earlier in February to kind of refresh his memory because he'd heard the story from Commander Fravor back in 2007. And he said, well, the interesting thing is that uh, that video was no longer online and that a couple of years earlier, Commander Fravor said, he and Lieutenant Commander Slight and the four F-18 crews that had gone out there after them and a Marine Corps F-18 crew that happened to be in the area, plus the E-2 Poseidon uh, early, uh, early aerial warning plane, you know, it's one of those big screw top radar planes. Uh, had and the uh, the radar operator and the fire control operator on the USS Princeton and the crew of the USS Los Angeles, which was a fast attack nuclear submarine that had been in the area, had all been interviewed by somebody from a three letter agency of the United States government, mm. and the YouTube video had been pulled offline. Mm. Now, three letter agency. Hmm, what could that be? Just a defense intelligence agency, perhaps. The very agency that uh, was investigating UFOs for the Pentagon as part of this program set up by Harry Reid and run by Luis Elizondo, who just coincidentally was the main source of the story published by the New York Times yep. and the source of the video. Now, bear in mind that just before the story was published by the Times, Luis Elizondo quit his job with the government and took a job working with Tom DeLong mm-hmm. for his new venture to the Stars Academy right. of Arts and Sciences. Now, As we point out in the book, the United States intelligence community and presumably intelligence agencies from other countries around the world, Russia, China, the Great Britain, France, so forth, have had their fingers in the the, the UFO uh, accounts and and kind of shape the narrative, shape the stories that we humans, that we uh, lay people have been getting about UFOs. Interestingly enough, the 
the board of directors or the executive staff of To The Stars Academy is loaded with guys who come right out of the intelligence community. Dr. Hal Putoff, who directed the uh, remote viewing research for Stanford Research Institute back in the 70s and 80s, which is part of the Stargate project for the CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, the vice president of operations retired from the CIA in 2007. And since then, he trains other agents and spy craft. Uh, their aerospace division director spent 31 years as program director for the advanced systems group at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works, the guys that developed the stealth fighter and the SR-71. Uh, Chris Mellon, who was defense, is set, de deputy assistant secretary of defense for intelligence under Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Um, they've got a brain function and consciousness consultant. Why are all these guys involved in USO, uh, involved in UFOs interested in consciousness anyway? I'm just curious. That's interesting. Um, yeah, good. Yeah. He, <laughs> yeah, he won a certificate of commendation from the Central Intelligence Agency for, and I quote, significant contributions to the mission of the Office of Research and Development for the CIA. Yep. Uh, yep. And anyway, uh, you get the picture. There is a very heavy intelligence community footprint on the staff of this To the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences. That's why it's says, so hard to trust it. Yeah, that's why, and, and they say their yep. mission is to produce content, both educational and entertainment, about the UFO uh, phenomenon and the, the existence of ETI. So uh, two possible explanations here, in my view, um, you know, above and beyond the ones that Josh already gave, that this has something to do with uh, just another bizarre coincidence. And I will say for the record, neither, neither one of us is a coincidence theorist. That's uh, right. Two additional explanations. One is that these are all true believers who are just using their decades of experience in researching this field to, to get the word out to the world that our space brothers are here to help us. The other possibility, which I think is critical thinkers we have to consider, is that this is just the intelligence community doing what the intelligence community does, which is sell us on a particular story that they want us to believe that benefits their employers the government. Right. Why would the government want us to believe this is actually extraterrestrials? Why do they want people in 1947 to believe that the Maury Island incident was UFOs? Why did they want people in 1947 to believe that something from outer space crashed at Roswell? Hmm. Maybe it has to do with other projects that they're researching and working on that they don't want anyone else to know about. Right. Maybe we don't want Russia and China to know that we have a drone that can fly 3,600 miles per hour and not leave an infrared signature. In 2004. In 2004. 14 years ago. Yeah. 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 Gus, we're, uh, we're about out of time, but where, where can people get the book and uh, also give out to you guys websites where people can contact y'all? Sure. The absolute best place right now, the easiest place, is if you go to officialdisclosure.com. It's very easy to remember. And I am so thankful that Tom bought that domain years ago, seeing yeah. that it would be important in the years ahead. Yeah. Uh, if, if you go to officialdisclosure.com, very first thing right on that page, you will see the, 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 the amazing deal that you can get. So you buy the book for exactly what the book costs and you get all this free stuff. So we kind of talked about some of this before, but you, you get my, uh, my other book that I just released, uh, unraveling the multiverse, all about quantum physics and the Bible and spirituality and how, how can, uh, the, you know, absolute most up-to-date science have anything to do with ancient Christianity and Judaism quite a bit, uh, quite a bit. Uh, so you get that, you get, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser's two books, the, uh, the facade and the portent, which of, of course they're written as fiction, but they're more accurately described as faction because he puts so much actual real factual uh, research in those books, and he puts uh, footnotes in so people can uh, can check those out. And they're, it's just good storytelling. I mean, it's it, it, it's phenomenally mm -hmm. written. Those two books. You also get the Secret Vatican and Alien Antichrist Connection by Tom Horn. Phenomenal uh, presentation. It's a DVD. You get official disclosure. The audio series. Uh, you get my talks. Uh, quantum physics in prophecy. You get a couple things there uh, that I did video. Uh, then you get Project Stargate, which cannot be found anywhere else. You cannot buy you, well, really any of this stuff. You, 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 you with Project Stargate, you cannot buy this separately. But you get interviews with 
12 experts uh, and they don't always agree. <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, 12 experts on the UFO alien abduction phenomena. So you get Joe Jordan, you get L.A. Marzulli, you get uh, the late Chris Putnam, uh, Russ Dizdar, you get uh, Paul McGuire even uh, is in there. Uh, a, a lot of a lot of Joyce Aarons uh, who actually gave us more information than admittedly she even said in the in the video that, that she's ever given anyone before. Uh, a lot of different people. So if you go to officialdisclosure.com, you can find all the information there. You buy the book for $39.99, and then you get the rest of that for free. So officialdisclosure.com will uh, give you all the information you need to know. Right. Cool. Excellent. Yep. And Derek, um, do you have- Oh, I'm just going to say what he said. What he said. Well, and you, you also he said. have your show. <laughs> you, yeah. Your oh, yeah, show, yeah, yeah. View I mean, from the Bunker. Sky- yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, Skywatch TV, my website, my personal site is DerekPGilbert.com. That's D-E-R-E-K-P and then gilbert.com. And uh, I usually link to just about everything that I do there. So the stuff that goes up at View from the Bunker or PID Radio or Skywatch TV or our weekly Bible study that my wife and I do, uh, all of that stuff will eventually wind up at DerekPGilbert.com. Excellent. Yeah, and I have uh, JoshPeckDisclosure.com. And uh, uh, it's brand new, still updating it. People can uh, go there. I would not hate it if they wanted to click on the donate link. That would be fine with me. But uh, <laughs> JoshPeckDisclosure.com, uh, if people want to follow me. Still Excellent. has that new website smell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being on. Uh, and thank hopefully you. this will not be the – this will this – will, this is the, the first time of many. So uh, Enjoyed it. stay on the line for us. And, guys, we're going to close out this section on Conspiranormal. Normal. <laughs> Rob loves it when we get biblical. I Don't do, you, Rob. I do. Well, here's the thing: like, it's not. It's not that I mind like anyone having ideas. It's it's when people have 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 any kind of belief and they go into uh, any kind of subject with a belief in hand that like it's. Um. And and these guys are great, you know. They, yeah, they, they truly absolutely. Are. They, they, they take things, you know, skeptically, and they, they're a very open mindset about it all. But it's 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 hard for me to understand how anybody could can because I cannot myself personally um, hold anything that 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 solidly um, with everything I've seen, with everything that's going on in the world, with everything that I that you know that I've experienced. Like nothing for me is that solid. Nothing. Like I I I can't I can't go into any like. I want to figure this out and I'm going to bring my own world view with me to try to figure it out. That just doesn't work for me. And yeah, you know, we talk to a lot of people that are that, that differ on that and that, and that's fine. And like, that's, that's just where I differ with a lot of, a lot of guests that we have on, I guess. Sure. Yeah. I understand that. You asked a really good question and it was a really good, solid question. Yeah. And I, I am and also he, curious about the answer to that question. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, if anybody out there has, has any ideas on that, like, I would be really interested because um uh, I uh Joe uh Joe Gordon Joe Jordan Joe Joe Jordan yeah <laughs> when when he was on like I felt it was the same thing when he was on I was like well did you did you go out and look for these people or did you just not have them come to you because you're part of that world kind of thing you know like that's that's what interests me like I want to know if it's is it the the belief in something and, and because for me like I the way I see the world um a lot of times i think i think there's a lot of power in belief itself it doesn't matter what you believe in i think it's the power of belief itself that is the driving force you know i don't think that there's not it's not that i don't think that it is i have no reason to believe that there is um one specific entity that is 
real and other specific entities that people might believe in that aren't real that you know i just i don't know i have no bearing whatsoever i have no proof well, on either side of the fence like to lead me to one direction or the other and for me it seems more like a belief an inherent belief and a uh, there um the power therein that that can cause these things because i know that there is a power to positivity and there's a power to belief if i go to a job interview thinking i got this I'm more likely sure. to get the job than if I go in there thinking, uh, I'm probably going to lose, you know, the confidence factor. Yeah. The, there's a very interesting discussion, you know, Soraya, he does these round tables and where did the road go? And uh, it's very interesting this, that this came up tonight. Cause I really didn't intend to really talk about that too much with them, but it did come up. Uh, they just did a round table discussion. Um, well, actually, one of the participants is our next guest, Ren Collier, and they talked. To the, they titled it "Everything Is Demons," <laughs> and uh, he had Timothy Renner, Melissa Martell, and Ren, and Josh was involved with it too. And so they they spoke about this this concept, you know, the, the calling on Jesus and all this. And although I'm a Christian. I can kind of step outside of my beliefs for a little bit. And honestly, to say that the whole calling on Jesus thing, I'm oddly enough, I'll use the word agnostic about it. I'm neither here nor there on it, but I will say what their point of view was on the, on that round table was that exactly what you said, you know, is it that you're actually calling on Jesus and is it actually an outside force that is causing it to stop? Or is it something that you're so profoundly believe in that you cause it to stop? Right. And because I, I tried to look it up online. I really did. I did some research and I found a whole bunch of a list of um, like Buddhists calling on Jesus and Hindus calling on yeah. Jesus. Well, of course that's not going to work. They don't believe in Jesus. Well, but, but like I couldn't find anything. I could not find a single source of another religion outside of Christianity calling on what they truly believe in to drive away this abduction experience. I couldn't find one, not a failed one and not a successful one. Neither. Well, well, here's, I couldn't find a case of someone trying here's outside of Joe Jordan's material. Okay. Outside of that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Well, here's something I was thinking about while the guys were, were, we were talking about this was that, the alien abduction phenomenon is primarily a Western cultural phenomenon. Sure. So people that That's the, the, the good majority up. of people that are Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist are not in the West. They're in the East where there's a different cultural, there's a different cultural connection. So they're not going to have that same, that same phenomenon isn't sure. going to happen to them because they don't. I disagree though. Believe in it. If it's demons. Demons are not going to just attack Christians. They're going to they, target everybody. Oh, I agree with not? that. I agree with that too. Yeah. So it should be just but as I'm, pervasive through culture. But I'm just saying culture. the 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 strict alien abduction yeah phenomenon where the Greys come and take you to their spacecraft and do stuff to you and then bring you back. They're not going to have that because they don't have they they that's not in their that's not in their cultural. Which is why I don't you. think it's a demonic. In the Christian sense of the word thing. I got you. Yeah. I said that. I, I, I think that there's many different ways to look at it. I do too. And I, and, and like, that's what I was saying. I, you know, I think it, it, it's, it, it happens, you know, it's, it's been happening to people for a long time and it's a real, um, phenomenon. And I think as long as we're all trying to find it from, a, uh, in a, you know, objective standpoint, then that's fine ideas any idea is 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 a great idea it's where hardcore set in stone beliefs start getting involved where i start to kind of shy away from it you know yeah a little yeah bit. yeah and it's kind of the same way with like the ufo religion and people that are that are so convinced that that these things are happening and that the that the the space brothers are real right that it must that, be that, aliens from zeta reticulum that same yeah. that that you know that's Absolutely. a that's a belief too yep you know totally. and, and and i think you know the, 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 what's been successful i think with this show is us trying to kind of stay out of that i just put that you know i have these guests on because i i want them to put their thoughts forward but somebody else that i get on 
is going to maybe contradict that and just view it from a different from a from a totally different point of view. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, we're about to have Ren on, uh, the next time we'll have Timothy Renner on those guys don't see it the same way they don't. And, uh, it's just, I, I think it's just a point of what, and they've both had those same kind of experiences. Yeah. And and I want to reiterate that, like, you know, both Josh and Derek, both like, I respect them both. Like they, yeah, they do take it from a very objective standpoint. Like they might, I might, I I definitely disagree with them on a lot of stuff or see it from a different point of view, but they do. Um, they, they, they do take it from a a skeptical standpoint. And I, I do think they are trying to get to the root of it. And that's, that's really what matters. Yep. Yeah. I, I agree. I, Wanted to thank some people, yeah. if we can. Uh, this will lead into Patreon. Ooh. So I want to start doing this because we've had some we've had some Patreons um, that have signed up. I want to thank Philip Young for his pledge, James Wilson for his pledge, Allison Cook for hers, and back in January first, we got two: Mark Johnson and Christopher Moody. And these people have pledged various amounts so thank you for pledging to patreon and becoming a patreon of the show and we're going to try to get another patreon episode up as soon as we can i've got uh trying to get i think timothy renner is going to do about 30 minutes with us for patreon so um thank you guys for for pledging any any kind of pledge that you can give it just all adds up and it, it just helps us with paying for the show and right now the show pays for itself. So thank you for, for we've also that. had a couple really good reviews on iTunes that I want to read real quick. Absolutely. Two of Please. them actually recently in the past week. Uh, the first one was uh, Dan Gilbert. Thank you, Dan. When open-minded curiosity, tolerance and civility seem odd, quaint, and even radical. Thank you for your refusal to be drawn into a phony culture war and your continued pursuit of universal human values. Excellent. Great review. Uh, the next one, good show was the title from Ryan Brooklyn. I randomly found the show last night on tune in. It's rare that a show can grab my attention quickly and keep me there, but it did. Excellent. So thank yep. you guys. And like Adam said, we're going to segue real quick into our Patreon. Um, if you want to support the show, our that's pledge drive, our pledge drive, that's a great way to do it. Go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal. We have different tiers. We put bonus episodes up in there. There's um, uh, wallpapers for your computer. We got, t-shirts or there's all different kind of tiers you can do there um if you don't want to if you don't want to do like subscribe to something and you want to contribute to the show you can do that on our website at conspiranormal.com there's a one-time pledge mm-hmm. you can go to um and that's great and if you don't want to if you know if you don't have the money to spare and you still you want to support the show a great way to do it like i just said is uh just a review on itunes or stitcher or wherever you listen to the show it takes 30 seconds a quick little five-star review means the world to us and we love you guys and we love hearing from you so and also, too, iTunes has the option that if you don't want to leave a review, which we do prefer a review, so we know what we're yeah. doing right or we're doing wrong, um, you can also just five star us yeah, as well. Absolutely. So thank you so much, guys. Um, and Rob, I hear Ooh. through the grapevine Ooh. that someone, an old friend, <gasps> may be rejoining us to <gasps> next time. Every week? Possibly. Oh, my God. This I'm is so exciting. Just going to put that out there. Oh, I can stop talking. Yeah. Luke well, take- <laughs> sorry. I'm just, sure I that we'll ask name. him a question. He'll still defer to you. Uh, the, I Rob, can't, uh, Rob, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not going to promise that that's what's going to happen, but oh thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks to Josh Peck and Derek Gilbert. We're definitely going to have both those guys on their own individual episodes. And uh, we are gearing up for episode 200. Yeah, we are. Um, we're going to have a we're all-star all cast. All for you guys, man. It's going to be amazing. It will be. You don't even know. It will be. Hopefully, we're going to have a studio audience as well. Yeah. So that will be good. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And we will join us next time on Conspiranormal Monkey Humping.
Come on.